The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to UMass Extension's Invasive Insect Webinar Series, Day 2 for the program. I hope many of you are returning with us again after having watched or joined us for the first day, and welcome to those of you who are uh, joining us for the first time. Uh, we have a couple of excellent presentations lined up for everyone this morning. Regarded, regarding spotted lanternfly, and I, I trust that this will be really valuable information for everybody who is logging in. I'm stalling a little bit because I can see the numbers are increasing uh, slowly <laughs> over time here, and we do expect uh, over 600 folks that were or that had expressed interest in joining us today. So um, I'll give them maybe another minute to log in this morning. A reminder, I think, while folks are logging in that I can address uh, while stalling for our uh, attendees to join is that, um, and I see Jason just figured this out, on the GoToWebinar control panel, you can ask us questions um, in, in the questions option, or it might be called chat on your end. Um, the organizers, uh, myself, I should introduce myself. I'm Tawny Simiski, the Extension uh, Entomologist uh, with UMass Extension's Landscape Nursery and Urban Forestry Program. I also have here today with me Ellen Weeks, who is helping out. And um, we will see those questions that you submit through the GoToWebinar control panel, and we can respond to you uh, as we get a moment uh, during today's broadcast. Um, so I encourage folks to do that. If you have issues um, on your end hearing or, or seeing the presentations, hopefully you won't. Um, also, as you are listening to two, the two presenters today, you can enter in questions that you have for them. And following their presentations, uh, we will have time to ask those questions and get those answers from our presenters. All right, so uh, thank you again to those of you who have joined in on time. I think that's the two minutes that I'll give everybody to log in that we're waiting for. Um, let's uh, move on with some of the introductions. First, I can't forget to say that this webinar series is a free series because of the kind support that we get from the Specialty Crop Block Grant Program at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So we are really appreciative of their support so that we can bring this cutting edge information to you folks for free. Um, pesticide and association credits, that will answer, I think, Jason's question and Zadie, I'm seeing Casey, a few uh, similar themes here. So I hope all of those folks that have sent in the questions to the chat about pesticide and association questions, read this slide and, and listen to these instructions. So. Um, all of our information and instructions for receiving pesticide credit for Massachusetts categories 25, 27, 31, 35, 36, 48, and the applicator's license, as well as applicable uh, other New England states uh, and association credits listed here will be shared at the very end of this webinar. So I will give you reminders throughout the day about what your responsibilities are if you're looking for pesticide and association credit, as well as a bunch of information at the very end of today. So the important part that folks who are here with us looking for these credits need to know is that you have to remain on the webinar until the very end to receive um, these instructions. So please stay with us through both our first and second presenter today. Um, and before noontime, we will give you the instructions on how to receive your pesticide and association credits. It is very important that those folks that are looking for that credit to please answer all of the poll questions that will be shared during each of our presentations. So we will have slide reminders that come up on your screen when that poll question is to be started and we will verbally uh, remind everybody that they should answer these poll questions. If you don't know what pesticide and association credits are because you're joining us and these things aren't important to you, um, don't worry about this information, but you are also 
uh, more than welcome to respond to the poll questions. We hope that everybody joining us this morning will answer those questions. Uh, but <laughs> again, those folks looking for pesticide and association credit, you have to answer all of the poll questions in order to receive your credit. You don't have to get the answers correct, but you do have to answer them um, through GoToWebinar. You can do this two ways. Um, there should be a way to respond and submit your answer um, through a prompt that will come up on your control panel. If you have trouble seeing that, you can also respond to the poll question through the questions or chat area. Just put your name and that you're looking for pesticide or association credit and the answer to um, which question that you're providing. Uh, if you sign off early or without having answered any of these poll questions, you will not be awarded pesticide credits. So these instructions are really important. Okay, hopefully that answers questions for a lot of folks uh, that are responding today. Okay, let's see. I believe these are all of the, oh, nope, one more. <laughs> one more reminder that I have for everyone. Uh, we do ask that uh, if you are willing to please, uh, everybody that is joining us today, to please fill out a voluntary and anonymous demographic information survey. The link for this has been shared in the chat. So please copy and paste that Google form link um, from the chat and put it into your browser. You don't have to fill this out right now while you're listening to our presenters. Uh, we don't want folks distracted, but we do hope you'll save that and fill that out for us after uh, today's program. Again, it's voluntary and completely anonymous. Uh, you don't have to do it, but it does help us to fulfill our civil rights requirements as recipients of federal funding. Um, so again, please consider filling that out uh, for today. This is a new link. So anybody joining us from uh, day one, uh, we ask that you fill this out again for day two because we know our audience changes um, day to day and we just want to capture everybody that is here today. Okay. All right, I see that I'm done with my morning slides and announcements and reminders. So let's get into the exciting part of today's program. I want to, uh, Brian, I'm going to send the request for you to share your screen and I'm going to introduce this morning, Brian Walsh. He is an extension educator with ornamentals from Penn State Extension. And Brian, we are just so excited and lucky to have you uh, speaking with us this morning. Um, <laughs> and I love your title. You've learned a lot dealing with this insect and thank you for passing on some of your knowledge and your wisdom to us in Massachusetts and New England as we're new to dealing with this pest. So Brian, without further ado, please take it away. Good morning. So you can hear me okay? Yes, you're great. All right, thank you. So thank you everybody for having me. I did speak, I believe in this series about a year ago and since then Massachusetts has had several more discoveries of lanternfly. So if you didn't pay attention last year, pay attention this year. Uh, these are things that we've learned the hard way. And um, that title is, is a little bit tongue in cheek, but there's a reason for it. And that is that as this is a new insect in a new environment, uh, first time in the Western Hemisphere, we are struggling to make heads and tails of certain aspects of it. And sometimes when we think we have a, a general rule, it, it seems to hear us talking and go and prove differently. Um, they're, they're pretty uh, malicious in that way. So there it is, spotted lanternfly, Lycorma delicatula. It is often shown this way. This is not how you're gonna most frequently see it. Uh, this is the adult phase and uh, the big yellow abdomen is only when it's sexually mature. Most of the time, uh, it's not gonna look like that or the wings are gonna be closed and they're, they're pretty inconspicuous in a tray uh, until they get into big enough numbers. So the early years, it was found in, in Pennsylvania in 2014 and it's a plant hopper native to China, Indonesia, Vietnam. It was probably introduced as an egg mass on uh, the product that was shipped or the packing material several years earlier. It went uh, unchecked, unnoticed for several years until the population got to be noticeable. And as a plant hopper, it's a hemipterin, 
it feeds on the phloem of plants just underneath the uh, the bark, that nice sugar rich area. And as it feeds on that sugar rich area, it doesn't completely process it and it excretes uh, sugar rich honeydew, a uh, polite term for excrement, which then becomes a substrate for growing sooty mold, which is another whole nuisance problem in and of itself with lanternflies. Uh, in in this first discovery, um, 2015, the reason that I'm here, it was about seven miles from my house. And so I was a commercial applicator at the time running a landscaping business and paying attention because we had a new invasive very, very close to our backyard. And some of the things said were that it can't fly. It's more of a hop and glide. We still have some folks that say they can't fly. Uh, they can only fly in a descending flight. Uh, we're in a straight line. Uh, which are which is not true eggs laid within six feet of the ground all your eggs are going to be in six feet within six feet of the ground i left this meeting uh in october went home and watched some laying eggs at about 20 foot off the ground so i knew that wasn't true they'll lay eggs under objects natural or man-made under on top of generally tend to be sheltered but not always uh on the underside of branches most common uh, that it must take a meal from the Atlantis altissima, the tree of heaven, in order to complete its development from nymph to adult, we were told. And so I left that meeting thinking, well, that's pretty good. It can't move real far. You get rid of the Atlantis and you're going to take away its ability to um, reproduce. And we were told that the nymphs walk up and down the, the trees daily and that uh, because of that, you could use sticky bands to catch nymphs. And out of that, uh, we can rule that out pretty quick. And a little bit further on, it took a little time to do so, we can rule that out. So you can see early on, there was, there was a number of assertions made that turned out to absolutely not be true. Um, I've been following a little bit in Massachusetts, and this was from the brink. If you see a spotted lanternfly, report it, squash it. And further in that article, it says, not too many bugs are more destructive than my Cormodella catula, better known as spotted lanternfly. It's threat to trees, plants, crops, orchards, vineyards, even jobs. How true is that? Well, here we are, you know, seven years later, and uh, well, this was six years after that, the one I just showed you, and how true is that? You know, that it's it's more, uh, not too many more bugs are, are more destructive. And is it really that destructive? Well, you know, here's an image to look at, and that's EAB, hunt lantern fly. And I, I say that, you know, Lanternfly is not causing damage anywhere near the scale of EAB. And so is it the most destructive thing we've seen? Eh, no. Uh, is it a problem? Yes. Don't, don't get me wrong. It's still a problem. It's, uh, the sky's not falling. But what we are seeing killed is Atlantis altissima, which is an invasive and, and a weed tree. And, and uh, we see grapes can get killed pretty quickly. These, these insects will really cue in on, on the Atlantis and on the grapes. And because of that, they feed voraciously and these plants are dying, but they're the only ones that we've seen consistently killed. So is the sky falling? Why is the sky falling? Headlines like this, you know, worst invasive species seen in 150 years, nowhere close. It's nowhere close to EAB. It's nowhere close to um, loss of the chestnuts but it's still a problem. So we kind of have to keep it into that perspective as we deal with it. Lanternfly is univoltine, one life cycle per year. It overwinters as eggs. Those eggs are fairly inconspicuous. Um, they're laid in the fall. The adults are killed by a freeze. The first three inch stars that hatch out in the spring are that black and white. Quarter inch is too big. That would be about a third inch star. Early inch stars, more like a pencil point size. Um, the way to know, a lot of people think they have a tick problem, a deer tick problem, go to go to touch it, and if it hops, it's it's a lanternfly. And fourth in stars, when they get this nice red coloring into their their uh, shell, and then we turn into adults, about an inch, inch and a half, depending, some are healthier than others, some are larger, some are smaller. Males are generally about a quarter inch smaller than the females. This is what you really should be prepared to look for when they're disturbed, they'll, they'll display those hind wings with the, the bright colors. Um, but as I said, it, it's univoltine where there's a killing freeze. Without a killing freeze, if this gets to California, if this gets to Florida, 
we don't know. We might be seeing multiple generations in a single season. Those eggs, most of them, contrary to the initial report about being within six feet of the ground, are actually above six meters. We went out, we just cut trees down, rolled out the tape measure, measured uh, where the, the eggs were found, and far and away, the majority of them were in the upper two thirds of the trees. So it makes it difficult to see from the ground. We're not very good even with binoculars at finding them from the ground. Um, and you can see they're pretty small compared to a penny and in, in thickness and, and what they look like, that covering dries back to that nice grayish brown. And that little dab there is 30, 35 eggs on average. So it doesn't take many. They'll lay them anywhere, not just on the, the plants that they're feeding on. They don't feed on conifers. We see them try and feed, but they won't successfully feed on conifers, but they will lay their eggs in there. And so if you're a Christmas tree grower, when you go harvesting trees and you have to comply with quarantine to be phytosanitary, have no eggs in there, sticking your head in every Christmas tree you cut down the ship in October and November is, is problematic. They can be on small, tiny twigs. That was brushed there in the second picture. They don't always lay on the plants themselves. Sometimes they like to lay the eggs on the nursery stock tires. That's how we they get moved around pretty quickly. They lay on items that people move. And because of that, we've helped them spread further and faster than they would naturally spread. Uh, it, it's There's no shortage to what the eggs can be laid on. You have to be aware if you're taking something from an infested area, particularly campers, trailers, things like that, you can easily start a new population in a new area uh, when you move those items. The eggs will hatch in May, roughly 30 to 50 eggs on average in an egg mass. The eggs hatch from the individual egg mass, I need to correct that, mostly over a two-day period we found, but individual egg masses on a site are over multiple weeks. So Eggs can be laid on any any flat surface, firm surface. Doesn't have to be smooth. Um, doesn't particularly have to be hard. Um, but the microclimates on different sites will greatly vary the hatch timing. If you're on the north side of a hill, it can be a month later than just over the hill on the south side, where they accumulate degree days faster. The a chill seems to help increase the success rate of the hatch, but it's not necessary. You can take those eggs directly from being laid and hatch them out. The cold weather death of eggs is unlikely in a lot of areas. Maybe in the in the further, uh, the higher elevations in New England, uh, more probable as you get up into Maine and the Canada, there's a greater possibility that there'll be less survivorship. But in Pennsylvania, the cold weather has not really had much impact when we do have a cold winter, which we haven't this year. Uh, the First through third inch stars, they, they spread out. They feed on anything that's soft and luscious, particularly roses as the first and second inch stars. And that can be multiflora rose. Uh, any, any roses, you're bound to found, find them on there, but they're not overly particular. As long as that material is soft and lush and they can get their mouth parts into it, they're gonna feed from it. And when they do that, they feed for a little bit and they move. This was a study that was done in a contiguous forest where the nymphs were rolled in fluorescent dye powder and then released and then quote recaptured by using ultraviolet lights at night and that fluorescent dye powder lights them up like Christmas tree bulbs and you can see from this slide here the just third instar the dispersal distances after seven days we're getting out over 50 meters and so you know 50 meters for something that's a quarter inch in size it's pretty far. The max distance recovered on that was 65 meters at 10 days. And so if they're doing this every every week, they just continue to move and move and move. It doesn't take long for these nymphs to feed, move, feed, move, and get some distance from where they started. They're not just going up and down the trees where they hatch at. Um, there's probably some restriction on those dyed in, in the powder too. As you can see in the video, they uh, got kind of caked up, paper mache and probably would have moved further had they not been. When we get to that fourth instar stage, they get that red color, and that's where really where we start seeing them aggregate together, congregate together, and feeding in groups, and also feeding on twigs. Now they're not feeding in that year's growth, but they can, they can feed in the one-year-old twigs. At this point, we see a, a really strong shift from 
uh, generalized feeding on all kinds of different plant material to the Elanthus altissima, as well as black walnut, Juglans nigra. In, in my experience, it's uniform attractiveness at that point, uh, particularly in the second and third years when the Elanthus have been hit pretty hard in previous years, they'll start venturing more onto other things, particularly black walnut at the fourth and star stage. And we do see those trees being stressed. We see the, the, um, the nutrients being bleached out of the leaves. They start looking um, chloritic and they almost flag bright yellow and that's how we look for them. But what's more important to understand is what is available is what they're gonna feed on. They can feed on just about anything. What's available will always determine what they're feeding on. Uh, the adults, they, they molt into adults around here. It's the beginning of August, generally. Uh, they will walk. They're very happy walking. They can fly, they can uh, fly as well. Those yellow bands that I pointed out in the beginning, you can see as they're sexually immature, those yellow bands are not at all uh, prominent or even visible. But as they start to develop through the season, you see first the lateral bands and then across the whole abdomen. It expands out like an accordion. And what you can see here is that the male, the, the last segment of the abdomen is a valvifer, and the male it's black, and on the female it's that red. Sometimes after she's laid and, uh, and it's a little bit gooped up with the wax covering on the eggs, just to wipe it off and, and you'll see that it's still red there. Uh, easy way to indicate uh, which or which. So there's the first poll question for you. Thank you, Brian. We'll get that running. And again, here's my friendly reminder to folks that need pesticide or association credits, please make sure you're filling out the poll. Um, otherwise, we do invite everybody to answer the poll question. So the poll question is up. And hopefully this is the right one. Prolonged untreated infestations of spotted lanternfly causes the deaths of many plants, including fruit trees, ornamentals, and forest trees. True or false? And if for some reason you can't see that on your device, you can answer in the um, questions box. And I've just gotten a request to repeat the question for people who can't see it. The question is, prolonged untreated infestations of spotted lanternfly causes the deaths of many plants, including fruit trees, ornamentals, and forest trees. True or false? We'll give everybody about 10 more seconds to answer this, and we'll close the poll. Okay, this poll is closed. And Brian, the results are 49% answered true and 51% answered false. Oh, that's too clear. The only trees being killed, the only plants being killed outright are grapes and Alanthus. That's it. We're not seeing mass death of trees. Do you think I should go back and do that whole first section again? <laughs> oh, hopefully they'll remember now. <laughs> you're, All right. You're good. Go forward. All right. All right. Here we go. So when we talked about, I talked about the the banding efforts to catch spotted lanternflies. It's it can catch a lot of spotted lanternflies. These is just this is giant fly paper you see on the right. Uh, you can get that at Tractor Supply or your local feed store, Agway. The middle there is modified circle traps. Those are something 
that you can buy, you can make. We have an article on the Penn State Extension site. You can use that. You don't have to use the container on top. You can put a bag on there and catch a bunch more. Uh, the upper corner here, this is Bug Barrier. That's a commercial product that you can buy. It's applied by a grad student there. That's absolutely uh, crooked, not the way to do it. But uh, what happens is the nymphs do climb trees. They will climb those trees and get stuck in the traps. And so this is a methodology that many people use to try and control populations, which I don't think it's particularly good for. You can have an impact, but you're not getting that many of them. Uh, but I went out this summer and tried to find out which of these is most sensitive, because the other way, reason these are used are for monitoring. Monitoring populations, I know in Massachusetts that uh, these types of devices have been used to try and delineate where the lanternflies are, how far out from the original find. And so I set out and, and examined how, how these different traps, how sensitive they are to the population present. And the way that I tested it was, was to take the, the sticky bands, we cut them down to about four inches wide, and we put window screening over and we kind of fold it and put a pleat with a push pin in there to keep the bottom open and the top closed. And this is to protect uh, birds and mammals from getting stuck in the bands. Uh, that's been a problem. People have used a lot of sticky bands in our area and caught everything up to, including hawks and uh, bats, squirrels, things like that. So if you're going to use sticky bands, we highly recommend that you use a, a wildlife barrier to keep uh, the wildlife out. The modified circle traps, they wrap around the trees, bought those commercially in the bug barrier band. And the way this works is the outside of this is just plastic film. The inside facing the tree is sticky. You wrap a little bit of batting around the tree and then you unroll and cut off a piece of this which sticks to the batting and the sticky side is facing in and that keeps the wildlife from, from getting caught. So the site that we chose to, to do this at, it's a uh, disturbance site, classical anthus site, very very poor soil, it was cut through to make a levee. And you see, we cut out the vegetation so that we didn't have uh, the, the insects being able to move back and forth uh, along the brush and wanted to focus them on the trees. We went up to about a four meter depth, tons of eggs. In fact, these eggs on this site were laid right up in the rock face, all in these exposed rocks up in the hill. We had plenty of eggs there and then up in the trees and then on the non Atlantis host, there was tons of eggs. And this is what it looked at. And the design was to do one of the three types of traps on the bottom trap, and then every top trap was a sticky band. And what we were measuring was how many, uh, what percentage of the insects that climbed the tree were caught in the first trap versus being caught in the second trap. And how many did we catch? Well, at this site, through the course of the summer, we caught about 80,000 lanternflies. And, um, through the end, when we were doing our live counts on those 27 trees, we still had over 800 present. So are you able to kill a lot with, with these bands and these traps? You can kill a lot, yes. But I can tell you that what we took out of there was next to nothing compared to the rest of that hillside uh, running running down the, uh, the bank. So uh, the populations fluctuated. You can see we started out real strong, and then they dropped off, and then they picked up and they dropped off and then up into the adult phase here they were pretty low and then picked up again and this is the migration as i said before they move they're on the move the population really never stops moving until they freeze out and what we saw as results <clears throat> what this graph is showing you <clears throat> excuse me each set of vertical lines represents a tree each dot uh each dot by color represents what type of trap the lower trap was. The bigger the dot, the more lanternflies were caught on it. And where this falls, this is zero to 100, 100%, every tree was, was evaluated as what was caught was 100%. And where this dot with the lower trap falls shows what percentage of the insects caught from that tree that week were caught in the first trap. And then anything above that dot were caught in the second trap. And you can see the, the early um, numbers were pretty high, what we were catching, the, the bigger circles. And you can see very clearly here throughout the season, 
uh, even through the adult phase, the sticky bands and the bug barriers were much more effective at catching uh, a greater percentage of what was present. The circle traps were catching an average, by the time we get out here into the adult phase, less than 50% of the insects present that were trapped. And so when we looked at that, we took a look at the circle traps. And when you close it, if anyone gets to using circle traps, you can close them on the, uh, around the back of the tree. And the way it works is it's just a funnel that they walk up into, they're channeled into your collection container, be it a bag or a jar. Uh, but if those, those trap wings don't come all the way together, we call it an open trap. And if it was, they do make it all the way around, we call it a closed trap. And you can see there, your, your sensitivity falls even greater. Uh, you're down under 40% of the insects trapped on those trees. If the trap was not completely wrapped around the tree as, and it was open, you were catching less than 40% of those, those that were present. So it makes a difference how, we, how you set up your traps, for, especially for monitoring, make a difference. The bug barrier and the sticky bands are the much more effective traps. But we ask that question then too, does the diameter of the tree, the bigger tree, do they draw more in? And statistically, it made no difference. The DBH had no statistical impact on, on the numbers present coming into the trees. But then when we calculated the distance in from the edge of the wood line, from the field there to into the woods, that did have a major impact. The closer you, the, the tree was located to the edge of the wood line was much more likely to, uh, to have more insects present. And that held true right through the season uh, and then kind of kind of bellied out a little bit. But then in the fall, when the adults started migrating back in, we saw that that effect take place again. So you don't need to go, if you're monitoring, you don't need to go deep into the woods, deep into the brush. This is an edge species. It likes the mix of the open areas as well as the um, the, the trees that it needs to use. So that question, these were all Atlantis trees, are Atlantis required? Well, I showed you that in the first slide, that first supposition, uh, as late as 2018, the Department of Agriculture in Penn State was still saying they were removing trees of heaven, which the lanternfly needs to complete its life cycle. And so working with several other researchers at Penn State, we set out, we planted these cages uh, with trees in the ground and put lanternflies in and see to see how they do it. Some of those cages had Atlantis present and some did not. And lo and behold, we got more eggs with Atlantis present in 2019 by about a factor of seven. And then the following year, we got more eggs overall. The trees were better established and still a factor of seven. We got more eggs with Atlantis, but we did not need Atlantis for the lanternfly to complete its life cycle. Absolutely not necessary. It may have an impact on on how well they can establish, the ease of establishment. It may accelerate the development, but that study does not prove that because we only gave them a choice of four plants and there's a whole lot more species out there than just four plants in the environment. So we know that it's a preferred food source. Atlantis altissima, tree of heaven, is a preferred food source, particularly in the third and fourth instars in the early adults, and sometimes right through the end of the adult phase but eliminating all the Atlantis is not gonna be feasible in most areas, uh, not gonna be cost effective, and it probably won't eliminate lanternfly. And just for a quick map of, there's where Atlantis is well-established across the United States. And you, you folks certainly have your share of it in Massachusetts, uh, especially along the turnpike. I love driving through there in the summers and, and looking at all the potential areas. Uh, if you're gonna manage Tree of Heaven, you can get rid of it. It's an invasive in and of itself. Do so. Uh, to do so generally takes some herbicides, unless it's not well established. But Atlantis has a clonal root that it can be very challenging to to get rid of. It takes sometimes multiple applications or some triclopyr to get rid of it. Uh, where do the lanternflies thrive? If you break down the environment into those natural con contiguous forest, we are not seeing lanternflies there. We just don't see them. Most of the studies that we started, uh, we, we had to stop because there was not enough presence of lanternflies to continue on with them. 
in agricultural croplands, and this includes all the tree fruits and, and um, all your other agricultural crops, except for grapes, those areas are not been problematic with lanternflies. They will move through, they will use, they will feed on different plants, but they're not staying there. They're not killing those trees, especially. In fact, my experience is they don't particularly like fruit trees. Um, and then we have those natural areas, the unmanaged right of ways, and those areas tied with the urban landscapes as suburbia. <clears throat> then that's really where we see lanternfly doing its best, where it can it can take that mix of all those different environments and have multiple food sources. This is really where we're seeing lanternfly. It's an edge species. It's not going deep into the woods and it's uh, it, it'll do okay in urban managed areas, but it really likes to have that mix of diet. One thing that we see consistently year after year is that the adults will move to maple trees and other hosts, willow, birch, in the fall, but the red maples tend to senesce the latest, and that, that'll tie in with the egg laying time. So this particular site we've been studying now for multiple years, and this is what those 50 maple trees look like. As you look up the road, there they all are, <clears throat> and you can notice these viburnum out to the side. And the days that, that these particular pictures were taken, we couldn't really find the lanternfly nymphs in June on those maples. We were struggling to find them, but over on those viburnums, there they were feeding on that lush, tender foliage, just feeding away happily, moving about. They were there for a week or two. And going back to what that overview looks like, we see this parking area here, this driveway, that's where we park because we don't want to be underneath the, the trees and, and take lanternflies with us when we move on that day. And my tree was covered, or my truck was covered. So why are all these nymphs heading out away from all these trees into open areas where there are no trees? Well, what we found when we looked out in the wheat that was planted there, that was winter wheat that year, there were the nymphs feeding on the stalks, feeding on the stems, feeding on the weeds. They can move through. They can use those, those plants to take a meal. Is it their favorite? Probably not, but as nymphs, they're happy with anything that they can, they can get a little bit of sap out of, a little bit of flow them out of. And when we monitored this site, we started off in June, and you can see the population just plummet. By the 4th of July, we're struggling. There's a first instar, second instar, we're, we're, we're not really making, uh, we're not really bringing the graph up at a lot, all with what we're seeing. And this is what we can see in the first eight feet. These are tiny. We limit ourselves to what we can see in the first eight feet of the trees when we were doing these counts. And this is across all 50 red maples. So by the end, beginning of August, you know, we're wondering why are we even still going back there and doing these counts? But then lo and behold, the adults started picking up. And they started picking up. And then we can see there in September, they just spiked up at the end of September. And when we add in that as adults, we can count above that eight foot area and see right up to the top of those trees or they're 30 foot. You can see lanternfly adults are very large. You can see them distinctly. Uh, with our two minute counting, th that population spiked up in that two week period, it jumped. It jumped from 509 on the 50 trees to over, over 16,000. And it was a pesticide trial site. We killed about 9,500 that we know of with the pesticides. So you saw that that influx jump by almost 26,000 in a two-week period. And that's a freak out point for a lot of people. And, and here's that site again, as adults, well, how are they getting there? How are they coming in in that two-week period if they're just walking or hopping and gliding? The answer is they're flying. Across that field is a quarter mile, and we were sitting there one day just watching them appear, lanternfly after lanternfly after lanternfly coming Across these fields, not all made it to the trees, most did. They would get to the tree and then they would finish walk, walking across the grass if they didn't quite make it. Another site is, is a quarry near my house. This is the asphalt plant. This pit minimum distance is uh, four tenths of a mile. I stood on that, that asphalt plant there up on the tower, which is about 50 foot off the ground, and just counted hundreds of lanternflies flying overhead across that pit. If that's not flying, I don't know what flying is. Uh, and when so when you think about that, if they're able to do roughly a half a mile in a single flight, it doesn't take many 
many flights like that to get some distance. It tends to be more in September, not the first month of adulthood, but more into the second month of adulthood that we see these big dispersal flights. And judging on how I watch this spread from where it started, I believe that individuals are capable of moving about seven and a half, maybe up to 10 miles a year. And we see it consistently with how it spread. And I hope that you can see this video clearly. I know it's grainy, but it's hard to film inch long insects flying out of trees. The, the clouds were just right there. All those little black dots are lanternflies flying. Now, for something that can only fly in a descending flight uh, in a straight line, perhaps my camera uh, was magical that day, or maybe that those first reports and uh, some of the continuing reports about not flying aren't correct. And I say they fly, they fly well. They don't always fly, but when they do and they get um, good rising thermals beneath them, they can go a really long distance. And so I say one more time, they can fly. Let's try it again. Okay, here's the poll question. Can spotted lantern flies fly, yes or no? I expect 100% correct responses. You know, if it was me out of spite, I'd say no. I was thinking we have 1% that have already been spiteful. <laughs> Okay, we'll give this 10 more seconds. Okay, this poll is closed. And 98% said yes, and 2% said no. All right, I can live with that. <laughs> All right. So here we go. One of the interesting things about lanternfly is that because they can move and they will move through the late season, you can have just increasing numbers on individual properties and there's nothing you can do about it. This isn't like treating aphids or scale insects, anything like that. Um, you can treat, and if you use a, a systemic neonic, this is dinotephron, uh, you can kill over a prolonged period. And this is a silver maple in my backyard. The picture you see, excuse me, the picture you see on the far left. Brian, can you pause for one moment? I'm sorry, we yep. seem to be stuck on the last poll. Okay. Yep. I just don't want folks to miss your photo that you're talking about. Okay. I'm sorry, it's, um, it seems to be stuck. Hang on. Okay, we're gonna share it and then we're gonna unshare it. I don't know. Can um, you share your screen? Are you sure you're sharing your screen? Let me send it back to him one more time. Oh, or actually, I think I have to take it over. Sorry, folks. That help? Let's yep. See. There we are. Go okay. ahead. All right. So, sorry about that. You see the picture on the left. That's a silver maple in my backyard that had pretty much zero lanternflies on it 48 hours before that picture was taken. And so when that tree was treated, you can see the ground beneath it in August and then September and then by October. And what, what you see there is that the one treatment of dinotepteron just kept killing them as they kept coming in. And because of that, you can, you, can, um, you can choose to use different active ingredients. We have all, a lot of that stuff available with our management guide online with the Penn State Extension website. Uh, but if you're gonna use synthetic pyrethroids, the bifenthrin and the beta cyfluthrin, you're gonna have to do multiple applications because you're just not gonna get that longevity that you would with the systemics out of a single application. Um, what does that look like when those lanternflies start falling dead? 
But with the Dynatepheron, you see the wings are open. We call it split wings. They lose control of their wings and twitch. And that's what you can pile up on the ground from a single treatment on a single tree. And it's pretty nasty. It starts to rot and stink. It smells like uh, something dead on the side of the road. But when we look at that, when we look at the timing of that, if your if your insect po population is not there through the season, and then suddenly spikes in September as the trees are starting to to get ready to senesce at the end of September and in October, it can make the timing of those applications very challenging. And so it takes some some scouting, it takes some some doing, but also understand that the population is not going to stay the same from year to year. This is that site again in in um, in Topton. And you can see the dark green line that spikes the highest, that was 2020. The next year, 2021, is the lighter line. And you can see that we never even got up over 2,000 on those 50 trees. But then this past season, in 2022, the number spiked up over 4,000, not full recovery. So the populations fluctuate. You're not always going to have the same presence there. If you're treating commercially for a customer, We've encountered this problem where folks have treated and the insects never came back. And this is a good example on another site that I'm going to bring in here. This is um, 67 maples the first two years, and then we dropped it back to just 20 because there was nothing there. 2022, there were no insects present. Um, excuse me, there were 17 was our high count one week at the very end of the season. But you can see the difference from 2020 uh, to 2021 just nowhere near the numbers present. And you can also see that that these 67 trees on this site in 2020 were nowhere near those 12,000 seen at Topton. And so it varies. This is about, these sites are about 25 miles apart from each other, both invested in the same timeline um, in terms of the initial infestations. Uh, it, it varies. You have to get out, you have to scout, you have to look and put, what we do see across all the uh, both of those sites for the three-year period is they're largely not present from the time that they are second to third in stars. They're disappearing off these sites into other areas out of the spur, out of the more manicured areas, the ornamental sites, and then they come. They're coming back in in September. And what's really interesting with that when they come back in in September, that's when they are laying eggs. This is looking at the egg deposition across those two sites in three years as mapped by growing degree days that were accumulated at the two sites. And you can see that some of the, um, some of the site years were much earlier than others and in terms of growing degree days. And we looked at that and we said, well, that, that's pretty big, pretty variable. But when we look at it by date, they all come into line. So it looks like the egg deposition is completely independent of the growing degree days accumulated. Remember, they're adults for a good two month period and they have plenty of time to lay their eggs and get moving, but it seems to be triggered more by the equinox. That, that's exactly the time that the, um, the day length goes 50-50. Within that following week, we start seeing the deposition of eggs. And that's been consistent year after year at these sites and other sites as well. And so, again, if they're going to come in right at the end of September to your site and start laying eggs, you have to be able to move or you'd have to have that site. Um, when I say move, you have to be able to move quickly to get your applications out with, with your pyrethroids or you're going to have to treat ahead, which is challenging. How, why would you treat ahead if there's no population present? And in some of the cases, they're not going to come back and you're going to have customers that aren't real thrilled with uh, your, your spraying when nothing happened. So as far as counting versus trapping, how we do our methodology, you can see here, this is 2021, uh, we banded. We banded on these trees at Topton, and you can see the sum caught uh, in the bands early on. Now, we didn't band the first three weeks because uh, we weren't that smart. Then we started talking about it, the fact that our population counts were dropping so dramatically. When we did put bands in, we were able to find many more 
uh, through that period until they disappeared with the banding in the early nymphal stages. And that was 24 hours of banding, put the bands on, take them out, versus two minutes of counting per tray. So time-wise, it's a little bit more. You have two, day, two different visits to do the banding, but you're able to, to see more. Now, when it comes to the adult phase and you're, and you're out scouting, it's pretty much uh, a dead race with actual visual counts getting better because as it cools down, the sticky bands aren't as sticky and the adults just fly over them. So in the adult phase, if you're scouting, my recommendation is to go out and do visual counts, two minutes per tree, and uh, take your time, look through the trees. In the early spring phase, if you're not seeing them, but you suspect that they're there, the, the bands are probably a better way to do it. When it comes to ovicides, uh, these, are, these insects are eggs for six months of the year. We'd love to be able to find a great way to do this with ovicides and knock them out and kill them. Um, problem that we've been finding is that we're really inconsistent at it. Uh, this trial, 2020-21, the, the controls over here, we get about a 60% hatch rate on the controls. This is golden oil, 50% golden oil, which is soybean oil. Uh, we apply different times in the fall as well as into the spring, and the asterisk shows statistic difference from the control. And most of our other rates of paraffinic oil, we're mixing in soap application first, insecticidal soap, followed by uh, the oil. It didn't have much impact with the exception of uh, just soap alone in December, but probably just an anomaly on that one. And what that graph is really showing you, each of these circles represents an egg mass, and this is what percentage had going up. So even though our control average was about 60%, you can see we had some egg masses that hatched 100% and even one that didn't hatch any. And even with our best controls, we still had 100% hatch with some of the egg masses. So it varies. When we, we did this again, 2022, with some different, um, different chemicals, you can see the probability of hatch here showed at, shown as, imagine this as a percentage, about 3% of those treated with 25% pure oil uh, hatched compared with our water control and our dry control, 60, uh, 67 to 73% hatch. Statistically, uh, anything that matched the controls here with the number eight was no different. So 10% golden oil, 5% um, pure, this is actually over label with that pure oil, 5% style it, uh, oil over over the label rate. So not legal in Pennsylvania. I'm not sure how Massachusetts is. There's another field trial. This was one all in situ trees out in the neighborhood. And similar, we see um, the 50% golden oil, which has to be hand applied, not sprayed into a tree. Um, and so you have to apply it into individual egg masses we did pretty good, but what went wrong here is that our controls only had a 45 and 47 percent hatch rate. Although, you know, you can see with those the varying um, dots that you have up to 100 percent hatch on some, even with the best one, the 50 percent golden oil, at least one egg mass had 100 percent hatch. So there's a ton of variability. And again, another trial with lab uh, tested from two different locations. Again, we have that that variability. We can see as little as uh, two percent. This is this is way off label. I would never go out and use that. But we're just trying different uh, chemicals, different methodologies. But even up at um, you know, we start to get to what is labeled a twenty-one percent hatch rate versus water control and dry control at seventy-five, eighty-five. What we tell people is you can reduce hatch using paraffinic oil sprayed in the trees and um, you can you can have an impact but understand that you are not going to get anywhere near the level of control that you're seeking out with those oils in most cases so we'll go to the the third and final poll question here okay the poll questions up on the screen and here's the question Spotted lanternfly populations remain consistent on properties from hatch through egg laying, true or false? 
If you are unable to see the question or able to answer on your device, you can put the answer into the questions box. Okay, we'll give this about 10 more seconds for people to finish answering. And here are the results. 19% said true, 81% said false. Well, that's not terrible. Yeah, can you see my screen again? There we go. All set. All set? Okay. So I'm going to wrap it up here as quick as I can. I'm getting out of time here. Um, when you're looking for lanternflies in in um, suburban areas, you know we, what we started noticing was there was definitely a trend into which Posts that they were they were feeding on. This is a shopping center in Collegeville, Pennsylvania, and what we noticed we collected we collected thousands and thousands of lanternflies out out of this site off the red maple trees that fall for doing our insecticide trials. And so we went through that shopping center. We broke the parking lots down, and we looked at the different trees. And each color there represents a different species of tree, and the number next to it is the number of adults that were counted on it. And you can clearly see the orange here stars being the maples, only three maples in this particular breakdown, but you can see far and away they held the majority of lanternflies. And so we looked across that whole site and we've done this now three years in a row. 2020, we saw up, up uh, almost the 5,000 lanternflies in those lots and uh, 4,721, we only counted 146. 2022 this year this past season we we were up at 250 probably statistically in the, in um, insignificant compared to that 4700 slight increase but you can also see that far and away the the majority of the lanternflies were found on those maple trees and so there is a little bit of a predictability to this depending what's on the site you can say, well, how did it go as volume of the trees present? The maple trees there, if we broke it down by total DBH inches on that property, the maples uh, in year one, you would average 13.24 uh, insects per inch of maple present in that shopping center. And no other species comes remotely close, no other species comes close to one. And that holds out the following years, even though there's a greatly reduced property uh, presence on those properties in the following years. So there is some predictability to it. You know, if you start understanding the life cycle, if you start understanding which host they like the best, um, you know, in this situation, if they there were no maples there, perhaps they would have gone to um, the sycamores. Right? Perhaps they would have gone to another one or they would have moved through and not stayed in that site they will move to what their preference takes them to. And so I say stay informed. The extension website is there for Penn State Extension. There's a lot of material for different types of um, applications, be it uh, for farming or for uh, nursery stock, things like that. There are different articles, pesticide application. And uh, thank you to all these people. That top line there, Lake Hoover, Elijah, Dante, Josh, Kendall, Liz, Lauren, John Ross, those are the folks that are out there doing all the counting, the technicians that are out there with honeydew raining down on them on nonstop, and it's a filthy, nasty job, um, but it's a lot of fun. So I say thank you, and with that, I guess we'll do questions later on. So 
believe I'm done. Oh, we can do questions right now if you still Would have. You like <laughs> yes, yeah. I we have about fifteen minutes. I'll probably push into the break just a little bit because there are so many good questions waiting for you. So are you ready? Yep, go ahead. All right, great. Let me see here. And folks, I'll try to get to as many as I can. Um first Anne asked, are there other insects that create egg masses that look similar? How distinctive are SLF egg masses? That's a good question. The only thing that I could really compare it to would be uh, spongy moth, formerly known as gypsy moth, uh, sometimes similar in size, nowhere similar in texture, and um, not, not at all that I've seen anything like that is that close to, to lanternfly. Uh, you can see this is an assassin bug here eating uh, feeding on a lanternfly. We do see assassin bugs laying their eggs with lanternfly eggs, and we see assassin bug nymphs feeding on lanternfly nymphs, and right through the season up to adulthood, we see them feeding on lanternflies. The assassin bugs are going to lay that hexagonal shape, uh, very distinct. So, you know, I always try and leave them present where I can if I'm, if I'm scraping lanternfly eggs. That's great, and I might jump to another question um, about what are some of the other um, either native predatory or parasitoid insects that impact SLF. Also, questions about are there birds or other um, vertebrate, vertebrate predators that impact SLF? Uh, so there's a lot of different insects, more generalist predators, arthropods, spiders. Um, there's a lot of a lot of invertebrates that will eat lanternflies. When you start getting to mammals, not so much. Um, there are bird there are reports of birds feeding on them, but far and away we see them tend to avoid them. Um, that said, there's there's some reports of different species have learned to rip the wings off and eat them without the wings. And there's a theory that the lanternflies are sequestering the allophone from Atlantis trees, and it makes them better, you know, the monarchs and, and milkweed concept, and that the birds generally learn to avoid them. Um, that's being worked on by Ann Johnson, a, a doctoral student at Penn State, and um, hopefully we have some more information on that in the not too distant future. When it comes to mammals, what I have seen and heard reports of is that skunks will eat them off the ground after they've been killed. Um, luckily, the Dinotephron has no acute toxicity with mammals. So if there is some presence in them, in, in the lanternflies that have been killed, um, it's not likely to be much of an issue, uh, but it's still a concern. We, we just generally don't see much else feeding on them as scavengers. Yellow jackets will eat the dead bodies all day long, but they won't they won't go after live, healthy lanternflies in my experience. Some people have told me different. I've never seen it. So that was a very helpful answer. It got to another question about do the pesticides used on SLF kill other insects and wildlife? You talked a bit about skunks. Yeah, um, yeah they, they, they can. Um, when you use a synthetic pyrethroid, there it's it's there's no holds barred it it kills everything that it hits or then comes in contact with for uh, as long as the efficacy lasts neonics have gotten a terribly bad name uh in in many quarters but if you treat the tree with a neonic uh, individual trees and once that material is absorbed into the tree it's not available to the other insects that just happen to land on the surface so um, you know, that said, neonics are much more persistent. There is some concern about residue in the flowers the following spring, particularly with maples, uh, even with Atlantis. And so that work has been, been started. And I believe there's some papers coming to be published shortly uh, that we've worked on. We've looked at a lot of this stuff. And far and away, the residue in the flowers has been below the lethal dose curves for even some of the most sensitive pollinators. So that's good news, um, but it's not a, an exhaustive uh, set of, of data. The, the 
later in the fall that the tree is treated with, with dinotefuron particularly, the more residue is found in the flowers the following spring. So there's more work to be done on that. It is a concern. It's on our radar. Uh, when you use a synthetic pyrethroid, you, you're just knocking out everything on the site, including the beneficials. And so you have to you have to um, do this with the under, you have to do this with a, an appreciation of what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, if you are doing this because you're trying to eradicate and it's part of an eradication program, I'd rather take a few beneficials gone as opposed to uh, prolonged year after year after year. But for us here, eradication is nowhere uh, left in the, in the rearview mirror at this point. And so we have to be a little bit more careful with how we're applying, what we're applying, when we're applying, because it's a chronic problem now. Uh, here, it's just a, it's a chronic, we need to learn to live with it. So, you know, based on what you're trying to accomplish uh, should determine what application you might make. And we always say go with the least toxic first. Excellent. You just knocked out a whole swath of questions. Um, thank you for that answer. I think the only other one I would add along those lines would be, um, you know, there's concerns about, like you said, neonics and pyrethroids and impacts on other insects. But one that was, was related from Serena is how, um, or have you noticed similar issues seen with using traps and bycatch? like what other insects or organisms might be impacted by the traps? Yeah, so most common, uh, I didn't go through that data quick and what I showed in trapping, most common is ants. Uh, ants followed by spiders, and then you see a mixture of other insects. Uh, if you don't use the wildlife screening, birds, uh, mammals, squirrels, mat, uh, uh, bats, things like that, um, Far and away, ants are the most common uh, accidental bycatch followed by spiders in, in what I've seen. Um, and well, interestingly enough, one site was cockroaches. So um, no, I don't think anyone's crying for the cockroaches, but um, it tends to be invertebrates, arthropods. Every now and then you might get a, a frog that climbs into a bag. I did not have that at all this year. Um, but, um, yeah, that it's it's uh, it's a concern. You know, it's always that question. To, it, it's always that that idea that you can't use an insecticide, you can't use traps to kill something without having some impact on something else. So you try and minimize those those uh, other impacts. Thank you. Um, another question, sort of related to what you mentioned about Pennsylvania being in the sort of chronic <laughs> phase here. Kathleen asks, there was talk about SLF doing long-term damage to black walnuts, sugar maples, and oaks. Is this true or false? I heard there was a white paper on this. Since SLF is an equal opportunity eater um, when feeding on black walnut, oaks, and sugar maples, um, Let's see, I, I guess just asking about yeah. what is the long-term impact long -term. on this and what, what, are, what are the ethics behind treating if we don't understand those long-term impacts? Uh, I'll start backwards. The ethics of it, understand that this was originally an eradication effort. Um, and so it was full bore eradication effort. A lot of the efforts now that are put into it are to prevent it from accidental shipping. Um, what we are most concerned about, Pennsylvania is the number one hardwood forest, uh, hardwood exporter in the country, number one or number two, depending on the year. And most of our hardwoods go to the European Union, which are all wine growing, you know, Germany, Spain, Italy, France, right? What we don't want to do is stop trying to stop trying to prevent the export of lanternfly to the European Union. Because the last thing we want is European Union coming back and saying that they're putting an external quarantine on Pennsylvania hardwoods in the effort to prevent lanternfly from getting there. So a lot of the effort now that's being done is in 
high risk corridors of shipping, um, train lines, places like that where treatment is really focused. And it's that prevention of accidental movement to places like Massachusetts or, or California, whatnot. So ethically, you know, the, the whole understanding of this has shifted. Ethically treating where we're not going to eradicate, there is still a reason to treat. And and conversely, if you're running a banquet facility that's hosting weddings, nobody's going to come to your facility if your trees are dripping honeydew all over the guests. So there are reasons to treat. When it gets to long-term damage, that's a very good question, and the answer is yes and no. We're not seeing the trees killed outright, but we know that they're being stressed. And some one of the papers that was just published, uh, just just published about a, a month ago, we did a lot of work with um, trees that had set populations at different rates of different densities of lanternfly per tree. And what the responses were, where we did see uh, a lot of impact on carbohydrate, sugar storage, and sugar presence in xylem. But what was most interesting in that to me was that we saw those differences, those impacts were very different species to species. So it kind of threw a monkey wrench into what the thoughts were it appears that the lanternflies are impacting different species and that that's a, that's right down to two species level silver maple was impacted very different than than uh, red maple and so we don't know is the answer uh, we know that there's damage that we know that there's stress being being there's stress occurring on these plants and we see the physical measurement of that in in the the carbohydrates and, and the sugars, the starch uh, storage, as well as photosynthesis rates. And so you have to, we have to do more work, unfortunately, is the answer to that. I don't think we should stop trying to do our part to prevent the movement. I know I don't think we should stop trying to uh, reduce populations where it's feasible and makes sense. The grape growers absolutely need to be concerned about this. They come back to the grapes year after year, even when populations are down around a vineyard and many people aren't even noticing later flies, the adults will congregate back to that vineyard from the, quite a distance around in the fall. So it's a very long-winded answer to your question. We need to do more work. Ethically, there's still reason to use insecticide and to still try and control. But for us, especially Southeast Pennsylvania, eradication is not on the board. So we don't go after every lanternfly we see with chemical, not by a long shot at this point. Thank you. No, that was a great answer. Uh, maybe just some clarification questions. Matthew asks, are you saying adults will feed on maples and oaks? Um, also, oh, I thought I could wrap another one in there, but go ahead with that one. They, they are, in my experience, much more likely to feed on maple than oak. Um, but that's not to say that they won't feed on oak. And, and that feeding period of, of adulthood can be up to two months until they freeze out and die. And that's significant. It's a big insect. Um, it can be significant feeding. And what the study that was just published showed that was just two weeks showed uh, in red maple, 40% reduction in sugars the following spring in this island. So even though it's a short period of time, numbers being high enough, they can impact the trees. In terms of preference, it's always gonna be determined by what species are present. In my experience, maple is always going to be preferred over oak. And for whatever reason, my my best wildest hypothesis is that oak is more dense than red maple. And and likewise, I see silver maple preferred over red, and I see red preferred over sugar maple. And if you think about that, it's a density of the wood that they're feeding on. But that's just a wild hypothesis. 
That's a great comment I wanted to add. I found the one I wanted to add from Carmen was, are there any red maple varieties that show less um, uh, preference for, or that SLF has less preference for? We haven't studied that in any kind of authoritative way at this point, but what I will tell you is that some red maple varieties, named varieties out of out of nursery stock are seem to be hypersensitive to the lantern fly feeding and uh, actually more physically impacted that we can see it um, in the tissue. The seems like the salivary enzymes um, are causing a reaction, a hypersensitive reaction in some varieties. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, it, it's a long process to establish that as a positive A plus B equals C link. It involves sledge biker tomes, staining salivary gland, uh, within the cells of the trees. And uh, Dr. Shugart at Penn State is a histologist who's working on that. Um, it involves electron microscopes to, to make this solid connection. But it does look like some varieties are more attractive and also more sensitive. Thank you so much. I'm gonna to try to squeeze in just a couple more and then we do wanna make time for the break here. Um, Thomas asked in the beginning, uh, the photo of the adults killed around the tree, was that a dinotefuran um, bark application? That was either a bark application or trunk injection with um, dinocide. So it would have been Safari or Xylam or, or dinocide that I used on that. Uh, year to year, I don't remember which ones I did. I'd have to go back and look through my, my log book. Um, yeah. Thank you. And then another question from Chris um, asking about SLF egg masses and where they are laid in sheltered spots um, near the ground. Uh, he asks if it is effective for those egg masses to be scraped and just left on the ground, or what is your recommendation? Do you have to scrape them into soapy water, crush them? You can just crush them. They pop like zits. It's um, oddly satisfying. Uh, when you see them, just take your thumb, run them down. If you're squeamish about it, there's all kinds of videos. You can use a credit card or something to, to pop them into um, alcohol, hand sanitizer, soapy water. Um, you know, it's your choice, but popping them, just using your fingers is very effective. And uh, I've seen people using rubber mallets, getting out and smashing them. Um, understand that every one that you squish is good. It's 35 less, potentially, uh, 35 to 50 less. But going back to that slide showing, the majority of them are up in the upper two thirds of the tree. Um, it's not an effective uh, eradication plan. It's not an effective control plan to just go out and and try and squish and kill egg masses. I mean, it's a great thing to do. If you have time to do it, if you see them, squish them, but um, it, you're gonna have a very localized impact with the effort, most likely. Thank you. All right, I can't resist combining two then I will let folks take the break. Um, from Chris and Tom, what percentage of the circle traps of uh, are, were only the closed variety that you talked about earlier? He says, seems like the open traps probably pulled down the total percentage. And then I wanted to throw in Tom's, will a leaf blower remove spotted lanternfly nymphs from a vehicle to prevent hitchhiking? Hmm. All right, so the, the, the circle traps, I don't, no, off the top of my head, I would have to look back. I, I think it said somewhere in the slide, this was not designed for that. That that study wasn't designed or, or um, properly replicated to look at that. It's just that we noticed that, it, especially watching it happen in the field, they were much more likely to get past uh, the open ones. So I'd, I'd have to go back and look at those numbers um, to, to tell you that. What I showed in the graph, though, they were broken out two different two different ways. So yes, the open ones definitely pulled down uh, somewhat. 
Um, that said, visually watching them in the field, we watch them walk right over the top of the circle traps. The advantage of the circle traps is you can catch more over time if you're doing it as a uh, control tactic. And generally that's more of a homeowner level control effort. Um, if it's for monitoring far and away, open, closed, doesn't matter, I would go with the bug barrier for ease of use and the um, more sensitive. Uh, sticky bands are very sensitive, but a little bit more uh, work to, to put together and, and put up, uh, although cheaper. And the the other question you asked the, was the circle traps and sorry, leaf, Tony. a leaf blower. Leaf, sorry, leaf blower. <laughs> that's okay. Leaf blower. So leaf blower will blow a lot off of a vehicle. Um, Lantern flies on the hood of my truck, thirty five miles an hour. They have rollia pads, which are you know the nice suction cups on the end of their feet, and they can hang on pretty pretty well if the if the lantern flies are up underneath the undercarriage of a vehicle, uh, probably unlikely with a leaf blower to get enough wind moving through there to, to knock them out. Um, I would um, I would say it's better than nothing. And if you're leaving an area that's infested and you're going to an area that you know is not infested, I would roll through the car wash more, more um, probably with a little better certainty that you're going to get them, especially with the hot soapy water. Um, that's that's generally what I do. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Brian. Uh, fantastic presentation. Folks are saying so in the chat. And um, thank you for your generous amount of time answering questions following. We really appreciate yep. your time today. Uh, thank you for having me. Excellent. All right. Well, we have another fantastic speaker lined up for after the break, but I want to give folks about 10 minutes, nine minutes. So um, we are going to have a very quick break and then come back promptly at 1030. So at 1030, we'll get started with our next speaker. So thanks, folks. Get up, stretch, walk around. We'll see you soon.
Okay, we are getting ready to come back from the break. Eric, uh, if you're there, I can pass the screen share over to you to get set up. Yep. Okay. Here it comes. All right. There you go. Excellent. And oh, it just changed to <laughs> 1030. All right. So uh, we'll get started up. I do just want to make sure and check in with Ellen before I forget. Did you pause and or restart the recording? I paused it. I'm about to restart it. Are we ready to go? Yes, indeed. Okay, here we go. Okay, well, thank you everybody for joining us again from our break for our second presenter here. I'm excited to introduce Dr. Eric Clifton, who is a research scientist. And hi, Eric, we can see you on the screen. Uh, he works with BioWorks and is going to talk to us about some of his uh, prior research regarding entomopathogens of spotted lanternfly. So, Eric, I'll let you uh, take it away and fill in any blanks for your introduction that I've likely missed. <laughs> no, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, let me make sure this goes back. Okay, yeah, hi, I'm Eric Clifton. So, uh, thanks again to the organizers, UMass, for hosting this talk. Thank you guys for attending. Um, also, shout out to Brian for that great talk because he really did a good job explaining just how much we're learning about this pest and all the complications with uh, managing it throughout its life cycle. Populations vary in space and time. Each year is really different. Um, so frame that into the conversation about biopesticides and, you know, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how to use them. Um, and just a quick disclaimer, yeah, most of what you're seeing in the presentation, actually all of it, uh, is work that I did at Cornell University. I started at BioWorks about a year ago. So just disclaimer, um, I'm not making any particular recommendations or promoting any kind of um, product. This is just work that I've done in the past and the results speak for themselves. Okay, so with that out of the way, uh, here's a brief over um, outline of the talk that I'm gonna give. Um, crossed out that first section, we don't need to go over what is the spider lantern fly. You know what that is now, thanks to Brian's talk. Um, but I'll start by going into how I got involved in the spotted lanternfly and a little bit about these, these epizootics with these pathogens. Um, and the end of Brian's talk was also a good setup because it showed a picture of that assassin bug. Um, let's talk about natural enemies. So broadly speaking, natural enemies are defined as any kind of parasite, predator, pathogen, competitor, any kind of antagonist um, that's associated with an animal or a plant. So in this case, this is a nice collage showing some of the different natural enemies that attack spotted lanternfly. So we have this egg parasitoid on the top left. This is currently being studied as a potential wasp to introduce. Um, there's this parasitoid in the top middle. This attacks the spongy moth, or what used to be called uh, gypsy moth. It has been observed attacking lanternfly eggs, but we got spiders, we got these predatory bugs and um, crane mantids, also spiders. So. It, it's great to see this out in the field, but because lanternfly populations are still popping up and spreading, it's obvious that you know all the praying mantids in the world can't control the lanternflies, at least not yet. But those are the predators, those are the parasitoids. I'm mostly gonna talk about fungi today. Um, so in August of 2017, we got this email um, from people at, in, down in Pennsylvania, and they found this dead lanternfly with this white stuff growing on it. So they sent it to our lab, we cultured it, identified it as a fungus called Bavaria bassiana. Um, you're going to get sick of me saying that word Bavaria throughout this talk. And then the following spring, um, May of 2018, uh, Ann and I went down to these field sites in Pennsylvania, dig around the leaf litter, uh, like sort of like mushroom hunters, and we're finding more of these dead adults that had also died at the end of 2017. And they had the same white fungus, cultured it again, confirmed this is Bavaria bassiana. So, summer of 2018 we got excited thinking that this could be a very common interaction here. we could be seeing lots of these lanternflies infected um, and the cool thing about Bavaria bassiana is it's actually a really well studied entomopathogen um, this is another collage just showing all these different types of pest 
that are true bugs or hemipterans that can get killed by Bavaria bassiana. So you got Bagrata bug, we got the famous brown marmorated stink bug down here, Asian citrus psyllid, which is a big problem on oranges and other citrus down south, um, and kudzu bug down here, which feeds on kudzu in the name, but also can attack soybeans. So this is a fungus that natu it's, it's, it's native, um, it's found in different countries even, and it can naturally infect these different insects. But really for any fungal entomopathogen pathogen to work, um, this is a nice summary or graph showing how it infects an insect. Number one is it always starts with the attachment of spores to the cuticle, then that fungus punctures or breaks through the cuticle to get into the body. Um, there it forms hyphal bodies, blastospores in the hemolymph that basically can release toxins to stress the host. And once it's died, then the fungus needs more food and then it grows out of the insect and produces spores to spread and you know, infect other hosts. But being a fungus, remember that it really likes uh, humidity. More rain, more humidity is conducive to more fungal infections. And I say that because um, as we started to work on lanternflies, 2018 was a very wet year. Um, in the Reading, Pennsylvania, where there were a lot of lanternflies at the time, it was like one of the wettest years on record. Looked there, it said 67 inches um, had fallen that year. And September was also pretty wet. So in early October, I got this email from Heather Leach. She was working at Penn State at the time, um, talking about spotted lanternfly. And she said, there's a lot of dead lanternflies in this area and I don't know what's going on. They're stuck to the trees. Come down here and look at this. I know you're working on the fungi. So we went down to this field site um, and I was kind of amazed at everything I was seeing. The picture on the left, this is a picture from Anne showing um, these dead lanternflies on the trees. And only one of the lanternflies in that photo was actually alive. Everything else in that tree, or a lot of most of those trees, was killed by this other fungus. And this is a whole different fungus, not Bavaria, but it's called Batcoa major. And it's actually a pretty poorly understood fungus. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about it in a few minutes. But the interesting thing is that when these lanternflies were killed by this fungus, it produces these structures called rhizoids. They look like almost like whiskers you can see in the top left. And those emerge from the recently killed lanternfly and it actually attaches it to the bark, the undersides of leaves, whatever substrate it's on when it dies. And we saw that these wings sort of spread open to sort of get out of the way of the abdomen here. And then the fungus actually shoots off its spores. And so those can get windborne, they can get easily passed around a location and spread to infect other lanternflies. So basically this wiped out a population in this area. Um, here's another photo back of major, this one's on the ground. And next slide here, this shows you sort of this like this powder, this dust. This is from these spores getting shot off of that dead lanternfly. So I just wanna emphasize the fact that this can easily spread to other lanternflies. Um, so we saw this in two different sites close to Reading, Pennsylvania in 2018. Um, you're seeing bar graphs here for mortality. Blue was any lanternfly killed by Bavaria. Red was Batcoa. And we were looking at cadavers on the ground and on the trees. And essentially what we find is there was a mixture or like this combination of dead lanternflies on the ground with Bavaria or Batcoa. And if you looked at lanternflies on the trees, whoop, I think it's, there it is, okay. Um, if you look at those on the trees, it was mostly Batcoa. So we describe this as a co-epizootic or two fungi working together to wipe out a population. So um, I'm not gonna go into sort of like all these hypotheses about population dynamics and invasive species, but this, this article is open access if you wanna go read it. Um, so that, that set off a lot of excitement. Um, I remember like after publishing this paper, there were people going on the news or writing articles saying, oh my gosh, there's this, fungus that's going to wipe out lanternflies and it's this magic bullet. Um, no, it, obviously if we're still talking about today, it has not gotten rid of the problem. Um, it, it, it's still around, I'll get to that, but Batcoa Major I don't think is going to eliminate spotted lanternfly anytime soon. Okay, um, fast forward now, four years have passed. Um, Anne and the lab have done more work on Batcoa and we published a few more papers on this and Here's the breakdown. Number one, it is not an easy fungus to grow. Um, we need very specialized media, like involving egg yolks to grow the fungus. Um, but here's a picture on the top right. These are hyphal bodies and liquid culture. 
this sort of like sinuous brain-like or like wet noodle-like growth, that is the backhoe growing on this, this egg yolk plate. Um, and that is not actually very easy to do. Um, but the other cool thing is that we have been able to set up bioassays in the lab to shower or to like spray these, these lantern flies with this backhoe fungus. And we do know now that it can infect all the mobile life stages. So we have successfully infected and seen Bacoa grow out of the early instars, the red fourth instar nymphs, um, and of course the adults. So that's exciting to know that it's not just the adults getting infected. However, sort of the bad news is that um, it is not specialized to the to spotted lanternfly only. Um, we went out and scouted some forests close to Ithaca, close to the Cornell campus, and Sure enough, we have actually found more insects, um, beetles, flies, other hoppers that were infected by Bacoa major. So I, I just want to emphasize the fact that there's not a lot of invertebrate pathologists out there and not a lot of them who even work on Bacoa, except maybe Anne and a few other people in different countries. And so we didn't know much about it in the first place. And it turns out it's actually a quite common fungus. And so we believe that it's spilled over and infected lanternflies when they came in. Suddenly there's this abundant population of a new host and Bacoa goes, yeah, I'll try that and it, and it infects it. All right, now we're at the first poll question where you can take over. Um, poll question number one, I guess I'll read this uh, and you'll you'll throw up the display here. Are you are you taking over on the questions? I can't remember. <laughs> You're good, yes. Yeah, do you, do you want to read it? All right, yeah. Poll question one, which of the following organisms are considered as natural enemies. A, spiders, B, fungal pathogens, C, parasitic wasps, or D, all of the above. Good luck. Thank you. And Ellen, do you wanna explain the all of the above? I, I think you can click multiple options, is that correct? Yes, choose all of the, the three possibilities that apply. All of the above, above isn't one of the possibilities on the poll on your screen. Okay. And another friendly reminder, if you need pesticide or association credits, please respond to this poll question, either with the prompt in GoToWebinar or uh, by sending us your response in the chat or questions box. Also, I periodically see folks asking about uh, how the pesticide credit process or association process will work. Again, another reminder at the end of today, following Eric's presentation and after our Q&A session with Eric, I will share that information. <clears throat> Excuse me. Also, if you haven't received confirmation for pesticide credits from day one of this program, I will talk about that process at the end of today as well. And just a reminder, since all of the above is not one of the choices, you can click one, two, or th all three of these responses as being correct. Choose all that apply. And we'll give this 10 more seconds. Okay, so this poll is closed. And here are the answers. 86% said spiders, 98% said fungal pathogens, and 89% said parasitic wasps. That sounds about right. If everybody selected all three, that, that seems about right. <laughs> all right, we did it. Hold on. Am I sharing this right now? I am. Okay. There you go. Thank you. All right. So that was just sort of a nice summary of the epizootics, how I got started, um, and a little bit about Bacoa. But those are not the only two fungi, so there's a little bit more to talk about. Um, talk a little bit more about Bavaria. So at the same time we found those sites with the epizootics, um, throughout 2018 we did go to other field sites based around southeastern Pennsylvania to see where we could find these pathogens um, in different times of year, different types of sites. Um, but if you're not familiar with this area, Philadelphia is at the bottom right corner over here, and Reading, Pennsylvania is right here. And that's kind of sort of the epicenter where I'm finding a lot of lanternflies when this work started. So every one of these hexagons is a site that we've sampled. We also got help from people at Penn State, 
uh, USDA other labs who sent in samples. And so we basically go out, get as much Bavaria as we can, culture it in the lab, and do some molecular work to identify it. And I say that because um, you simply cannot identify uh, a Bavaria isolate to species based on morphology, right? Like if you're trying to identify an insect or a plant, you can use a dichotomous key and you know you could figure out if that's a red maple or some other tree. Um, the problem with Bavaria is they all, they, they all have these white spore balls. They just look the same, but there's a dozen or more different species of Bavaria. Um, you, you need to use molecular tools. That's the main point I'm trying to make. So um, we wanted to set up to do that because number one, we want to see what if there's different species of Bavaria infecting lanternflies, but also um, even deeper if there's different genotypes because there could be a genotype out there at Bavaria that's just really good at killing lanternflies. And you know maybe we can commercialize that, make a new product out of it someday. Um, and so we sort of base this off studies that have been done on emerald ash borer. Brian mentioned this, this insect too. You can see the dead trees on the right. Um, other invert pathologists have studied Bavaria in invasive pests like this with emerald ash borer. So their studies found five different genotypes of Bavaria bassiana. They found two genotypes of a different species called Bavaria pseudo bassiana. And then they did experiments with these and found that you know some of these are actually better than the commercial strains used in biopesticides that I'll also talk about. So there's a map again, went out, collected hundreds of these over the years. Um, and basically I've only found one species in that, that genus. It's just Bavaria bassiana infecting lanternflies. Cool thing though is we found 21 different genotypes. Um, I'm just giving these letters on the alphabet based on the date. Like these are not official genotype names from any kind of organization. They're just sort of how I organize my data. But what was interesting was that out of like 165 samples, three genotypes popped up the most. They were just coded as A, B, and L. Um, and so those are the strains that we looked at further in uh, 2021. I'm not gonna be talking about that today. I'm working on that paper, um, but strains A and L, they grew pretty well um, in the lab. They worked as well as the commercial strains, if not slightly better. So there was some excitement there about um, you know, using these pathogens in the future. Um, some other cool things is that as lanternflies spread, um, we have found Bavaria infecting it in these different states. So it went into New Jersey, we found it there. Um, we've seen it in Maryland and we've seen it in West Virginia. And that, that's really no surprise. Bavaria doesn't really, doesn't care about state borders or boundaries or which football team you root for. Bavaria is all across the country. So as lanternfly spreads, you'll probably see it die from this fungus in different places. Um, okay, but there's some other cool stuff we found. So there's two pictures there. Um, of two different species we described. Number one, this is a green fungus we found. I've only seen it once in the field. This is Metarhizium pemphigi. Uh, it's poorly understood, but it's known to infect some aphids in England. It's infected termites in Ontario. It's also been found in soil samples. Uh, we did find it infecting a lanternfly adult. So it's got these sort of like olive green spores and there's a close up on the bottom. Um, and funny enough, Metarhizium, there's a different species that has been used in biopesticides before. So um, Bavaria and metarhizium are the ones you hear about the most when you talk about insect pathogenic fungi and biopesticides. But here's a very cool one. This is a new species actually. This is Ophiocordyceps uh, delicatula. So it has these long sort of tendril, tentacle-like structures. They're called uh, cinemata. And there they are growing on an auger culture. So these long shapes look like antlers almost. Um, you pluck an auger plug on the bottom right, move it somewhere else, and it like they grow out like these uh, these big whiskers or something. And then bottom left, that's a close up of these cinemata structures, and they have these sort of like canoe boat shaped spores. So that was neat. Um, very busy slide. Don't stare at it and get cross eyed at looking at this. But uh, the main point I want to make is that the diversity of these fungi is poorly understood. The taxonomy changes every year. Um, it's hard to keep track because, again, like the taxonomy is crazy. And um, we found that this species, Ophiocordyceps delicatula, uh, was pretty closely related to this clade called Hercetella citriformis. So I think they're changing Hercetella now to Ophiocordyceps. But this fungus, uh, 
similar structure, shape, color, these purple, pink, lavender colored um, structures. This is infecting an Asian citrusilla down in Florida. So that was cool. We found this different species um, that has not been seen before, and we found it in lanternflies here in the US. Okay, so over the years of doing this work, trying to find, describe different fungi, um, there's some lingering questions. You know, if this goes into California, elsewhere, I'm curious what fungi we'll see. Um, you know, thinking back to Brian's talk and thinking about the behavior and the flight of this pest, you know, I still have lots of questions about when and where to use these biopesticides. Um, there's also a lot of ecological questions I have because because of the honeydew they produce, that sugary substance, the excrement, um, it brings in all these yellow jackets, these big wasps. I've even seen yellow jackets fighting with larger wasps in the field. So it's almost like forcing increased competition. Um, but yeah, I just have a lot of questions about the science here. Um, and there's this, if you study epizootics, it's called epizootiology, but you know, I, we need more data on how epizootics can be predicted based on density, rainfall, and other factors. Um, and I just want to show these fun pictures because, um, like Brian said, yellow jackets aren't like attacking lanternflies. They will eat the dead ones off the ground like scavengers. But, you know, these trees are covered in honeydew. And so when you've got a few dead individuals with Bavaria here, the honeydew is almost like a glue and it can just like stick spores from one surface to the other. So um, we find a lot, we sometimes find these yellow jackets killed by Bavaria out in the field. And so I, I just have these questions about horizontal transmission about like, who's passing it on to who, and um, how does this play into the infection dynamics. But we'll leave it at that, I'll, I'll move on because it, it can get a little chaotic. Okay, so that was fun, some background about these different fungi, um, but let's talk about what you can do now because natural infections aren't going to take care of the populations. What about biopesticides? So we started to share some of this research in 2018. Um, some folks at Penn State said, hey, there's this park down close to Philadelphia. It's got this really bad infestation. Um, people probably aren't going to be happy if we go in and spray bifenthrin or some other kind of insecticide, but what if we test your Bavaria pesticides? So we signed on. We did this uh, collaborative project with Penn State. Uh, Brian Walsh actually helped on this too. And so we applied this product called Bottega. This is made by Certus Biologicals. Um, and the active ingredient is Bavaria bassiana, and it's the strain GHA. And so, um, you know, it's got a zero hour pre-harvest interval. It's got a four hour re-entry interval. Um, you don't have to wear as much protection when you spray it. And if you're not familiar with biopesticides, they're commonly used mostly for, I'd say most customers are using them for greenhouse pests. They use them for specialty ag, um, like, in strawberries and some other um, high valuable vegetables. But a lot of time when customers are using these uh, Bavaria products, they're using them for white flies, for thrips, um, and aphids and other high value crops. Uh, going back to the trial though, we had these field plots um, control and treated plots adjacent to each other. We sprayed water in the control plots, we sprayed Bottega um, and the other plots. And we did this twice. We sprayed nymphs in early July and we sprayed adults in mid-August. Um, there's John Ross from Penn State doing some sprays. And we used this like orchard vineyard sprayer that could go up to uh, 30 feet. And we did a number of things with the study. We, we wanted to look at efficacy, but we also looked at uh, persistence of the fungus on leaves. We looked at non-target impacts. So it was sort of a kitchen sink of different projects. Um, okay, this is just a quick summary of the findings, but uh, we did verify that the fungus was only there for about eh, like five to seven days on leaves. Uh, it quickly drops after two days. UV radiation kills the fungus uh, when it sits outdoors to an exposed surface. Uh, the sprays in early July, based on visual counts, we found that Bottega killed about 43 to 48% over the course of two weeks. When we sprayed again in mid-August, we sampled adults from those plots. We put them on caged plants um, and about 51% of those died from the Bavaria fungus over two weeks. So, you know, 50% is not bad, but uh, think back to Brian's comments about <laughs> the the people hosting like a wedding venue. Um, if you're a grape grower, you know, 
these pesticides can take seven days before they kill an insect. So if you want to kill them right away, you definitely want to consider something more fast acting. Um, okay, and then I talked about non-targets a little bit. When we did these sprays in August, we laid out these ground cloths around uh, Atlantis and black walnut trees. And we'd go there like every two days and basically collect every single dead insect that we could find on these ground cloths. So we had like thousands of dead lantern flies. Um, we'd only found 59 non-targets. And we could only, conf like we did, we actually did um, the genomic analysis. We'd culture fungi from all these non-targets and identify it. And only nine of them were in fact killed by Bavaria bassiana. Um, and this mostly was found in these other little leaf hoppers here, like down here, like they're in cannelineid species, but there's one there. Uh, there's this other species you can see right next to the liner flies. So it's not entirely safe to every native insect, but again, if you used any other kind of chemical insecticide, uh, you know, who knows how many non-targets that would affect. Okay, and at the same time this was going on in 2019, um, David Bittinger, John Rost at Penn State Berks um, did some work with potted grapevines too. So basically they'd spray the lanternflies, um, move them onto the grapes and monitor survival. Um, and we found that direct applications uh, worked pretty well, killed 99 to 100% after nine days. This also included a residual treatment, meaning that the grapes were sprayed and then untreated lanternflies were put onto those grapes and they fed, right? So with the residual exposure, um, that killed 57% of those lanternflies put on sprayed grapes. Um, actually, just last week, there was um, this other lanternfly webinar. Um, there are other researchers that have done, try to replicate some of these different studies. Um, you know, Brian and others had helped um, do some studies in 2020. We did not see as much success at um, Blue, Blue Marsh Lake when they sprayed Bavaria bassiana. I believe they were using helicopters for that. Um, but Phil Lewis from uh, USDA and some other researchers from Virginia Tech, they did some trials with these products uh, in 2022, and they actually got some success with the Tanagard. More than 80% were killed uh, when they were sprayed and then put onto these enclosures. So I think this is like mesh netting um, around Tree of Heaven. So they sprayed them and put them in here to feed. Um, so yeah, Botanica looked good, but they saw less control with uh, wettable powder formulations like um, BioSeries. And there's also a wettable powder formulation of Botanica that did not work as well as the oil-based formulation. Um, I don't, this is just new data from Phil, so I can't, you know, validate um, everything about this study, but it's just good to see other people trying this out. Okay, so those were field trials on biopesticides. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about lab studies I did um, in 2020. Because uh, BioSeries, uh, Bottega, that's not the only thing out there. There are a few other Bavaria-based products uh, to consider. So in 2020, I did these lab trials uh, with all five of these products. Four of them used Bavaria bassiana. So BioSeries, Bottega, um, Velifer, Naturalis, these are four different products and they all have a unique um, strain. So GHA here, this is the one in Bottega and Botanigard. Um, Velifer, this is actually a little newer product. Um, last I checked, it is not currently registered for outdoor use. It's only for um, greenhouse use. And then Naturalis, this is a product with this whole different strain. Interesting though, um, Certus does make a different biopesticide with a different fungus. Uh, this is a fungus called Cordyceps javanica, um, Popka strain 97, hence the name PFR 97. Okay, so um, summer of 2020, I'd go out with a little vacuum gun. I collect, you know, hundreds, thousands of these little guys, um, hand collect adults, bring them back to a quarantine lab um, at Cornell University, and they're reared on these potted tree of heaven plants, right? Lots of fun. And, uh, spray them with an airbrush in these cups, move them over to these plants, let them feed on their you know, preferred host plant, tree of heaven, and we monitor survival for two weeks. So there's little plants in these cages, bigger plants to feed adults. Um, you know, we've learned the hard way that these little plants cannot support um, adults for too long. So these are, this is the data here. Um, the graph is mortality after 14 days. Um, the different treatments, different colored bars. And I've circled the Bavaria products here in red for, for ease of reading. And so the point is that uh, 
about 90% kill uh, against NIMS using all the Bavaria products, similar efficacy. And we had about 95 to 99% kill of adults um, treated with the same products. Interesting was that uh, PFR97, that cordyceps fungus, um, it does kill, it can infect and it can kill iron flies and it does grow out of the body. So we know, we know it's virulent to them, um, but it just simply does not hold up to the Bavaria products. And I should say um, this species, Cordyceps javanica, never seen it in the wild, um, but after seeing that Ophio, losing track of my names here, sorry. There's Cordyceps javanica and PFR97, and then we saw that Ophio Cordyceps species in the wild. But um, beyond that, I, I mostly see Bavaria year to year um, naturally infecting them. So I was kind of not surprised that these products worked the best. Um, this graph also, this is 14 days after. If you wanted to know sort of how long it actually takes to kill them, the mean survival time was like six to seven days on average. Um, yeah, there it goes. Looks good, but again, this is a, this is a lab bioassay. So um, just take some caution that um, efficacy in lab trials is usually exaggerated compared to the field. That's actually kind of why I wanted to share that field data first. You know, we only saw like 50% control um, in some of my trials. Okay, so to summarize the field work, uh, to summarize the lab experiments, you know, I'd, I'd say liner fly definitely is a serious threat, definitely um, for the grape growers and maybe people in specialty ag. Um, but, you know, I kind of agree with, with what Brian said earlier, I don't know if it's the worst thing in 150 years, but it's definitely one of the more annoying insects that we've had to deal with um, in the last decade. Um, we know now that there's at least four different species of native fungal entomopathogens that can infect lantern flies. And, you know, depending on the time, year, uh, the weather, climate, you can see epizootics like we saw with Batcoa major. Um, we know from the DNA work that there's more than 20 native strains of Bavaria bassiana that can infect lantern flies. Um, definitely has some potential as a biocontrol tool, but um, I would say more field studies are really needed to tease apart, you know, the best life stages to treat, uh, what products to use, um, and being realistic about expectations, of course, that you spray these lantern flies with, uh, with Bavaria, they don't just fall over and die instantly. So, um, it may have to be used in <laughs> certain certain times and places. I'll leave it at that. I don't wanna make too many recommendations yet. Okay, we're at our next poll question. I can read it out loud if you pull it up. Easy, true or false question. Uh, the fungus Batcoa major is already registered by the EPA and approved for use in commercial products. True or false? Thank you, Eric. And I see folks are responding. Just another reminder, please be sure to do so if you need pesticide or association credits. Okay, we'll give people about 10 more seconds to answer this poll. And the poll is closed. All right, how do we do? And the results were 36% said true and 64% said false. Okay. All right, yeah, the answer, I can share the answer, right? I believe I can. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, the answer is false. We don't, we do not have a back co major product. Um, people have definitely asked, but um, now that we've done more of the work and looked at native insects, you know, I'm sure the EPA would frown upon it, but. Who knows, one day. All right, so getting to the last section of my talk, we're gonna switch topics almost entirely. I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, egg masses in vineyards. 
Um, but if you're a dog or a cat person, there's a nice treat in here um, because this involves scent detection dogs. So let me just highlight the map here. One second. I think I'm getting some echo too. Somebody's Sorry about on. that. I just oh. muted Ellen. All right. Let me get back. Here we are. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. So uh, just to set it up, we, we did this trial. Um, sorry, we did this program, research program, um, with the New York State Invasive Research Institute um, and some other researchers at Cornell. And um, we looked at um, these vineyards sort of based around eastern Pennsylvania and western New Jersey. And there I circled sort of the original core of lanternflies. Uh, so these these vineyards were sort of on the eastern front as that wave has moved out and gone into New Jersey. So sort of the blue um, marked markings right here and some of the orange markings, they are sort of more, um, they're maybe into their second or third year of lanternfly infestation. The purple locations down here in New Jersey were like in their first, maybe second year of lanternfly populations, usually lower density. So we had sort of a slew of high infestation and low infestation sites to uh, do these surveys. Okay, but what, what's this about? What are you, what are you talking about, Eric? The, the biggest point of this study was to compare human searches for egg masses versus scent detection dogs. So scent detection dogs, um, as of now, they're mostly being deployed to um, sniff cargo, um, searching sites that maybe have a new infestation of lanternflies. They're really good at finding egg masses and dead lanternflies when they first move into an area. But there was this question about, well, I mean, can we, can we use more of them to, um, to track populations um, in, in these vineyards and like to help people to, I don't know, treat egg masses or predict whether they're gonna have a good or bad ear for lanternflies um, versus people like me who are just sort of like crawling around um, you know, I don't have to use my nose, I can just use my eyes and tell you if I found an egg mass. But the goals were number one, to compare search efficacy within the vineyard, but also compare efficacy in the surrounding landscape. Brian talked a lot about edge habitats. Um, I fully support that description because this, this insect really likes to sort of live um, along the edges of vineyards, along wind breaks on roads. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that, but that was the, the basis of the study. Um, here's a map sort of showing one of the sites uh, out of the 20 different vineyards we searched. Um, we had 12 transects within the vineyards. So you can see this, this purple area where we searched um, along these rows, we'd searched like 20 random vines within, or, sorry, the 20 vines within a transect. We also searched uh, 12 transects surrounding um, the vineyards. So, um, Art and one of the, the women working on this project had set up these transects ahead of time and you know worked with these vineyard growers. Um, you know, Brian shared pic pictures, I'll show you some too. Here's cherry tree bark um, at a glance. What am I looking at? Boom, there they are. There's three egg masses right there in front of you. Um, I always love showing the slide though, um, just to like make the point about like how they can evade human detection. And that's why maybe these dogs should be used in some places. Um, and the egg lane is pretty prolific in some of these places and on some of these trees. Um, you know, I'm just looking up at this oak tree, um, holding my camera upwards and then, you know, there, there's hundreds on this tree and, and Brian's right again, like you can see egg masses on the upper two thirds of the canopy. They're not all going to be within six feet. Um, and again, a reminder, never move your firewood because they might have emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn beetle, or spotted lanternfly on them. So uh, don't do that. Um, the, the paper is still being worked on right now, but um, you know, Angela Fuller, uh, Ben, they did the, the data analysis here on occupation, occupancy data. It's not really my strength, I'm an entomologist. Um, but the, the basic gist here was that humans were significantly more effective at detecting egg masses in the vineyard, um, but dogs were significantly better at finding egg masses in the forest transects. Um, and that's kind of what we hypothesized originally, but um, the data is there to support it. You know, that makes sense. Like 
if we're in a low infestation site, I'm walking through a transect, you know, I'm looking at every tree or shrub that I come across, but I'm not going to see every egg mass. The dogs are going to sniff it, they're going to point to it um, and help the handler find it. But in the vineyard, um, the dogs are almost overstimulated because there's egg masses everywhere around them, especially in the high infestation sites. And they might just get tired or they get confused over time. And then they just kind of like lose the scent or they don't always pick it up um, towards the end of the survey. Um, you know, with enough energy drinks, I can find most of them in that vineyard um, in the span of two or three hours. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying that's what the data, that's what the data says. The dogs are better in the woods. Humans are definitely better in the vineyards. Um, but the other fun thing I've learned from this was sort of the best places, the, the most likely place you'll find a lanternfly egg mass. So this is one of my favorite slides to share with people and grape growers is if you think you've got lanternflies or you know you already have them, this is probably where you're going to find them on your, um, on your grapevines. You're going to see them on the undersides of your cordons, the tight spaces being trunks and supports uh, near the bases. Um, um, I hope Brian's not gritting his teeth because they, yes, they can lay their eggs in open-faced areas on the front of tree bark, on the front of the trunk. But, um, you know, in my searches, I'm just showing you that there tended to be a pattern of where they were found. Um, it seems like they're playing hide and seek. You know, they want to protect the babies. They want to put the eggs in places that they're not going to get attacked right away. So it's just some photos, uh, examples of that. Here they are on the underside of cordons. Um, sometimes really obvious, other times like on the left, not so easy to see. Um, tight spaces between trunks and supports. They really like these rusty metal poles. Um, some vineyards, you can actually kind of see it in this photo here, this newer pole that is not rusty. They don't really like laying their eggs on there, but if it's a rusty pole, they'll go for it. Um, on the right, this was a wooden post in the vineyard. It had like a big crack down the middle and I peeked in there and this was just loaded with egg masses. Um, quick story, I remember when I got to this vineyard in the morning, I talked to the, the owner and he goes, I don't have, you're not gonna find too much, you know, good luck, but you know, I've only seen like a dozen or so egg masses. Found this wooden pole, stuck my head in here and I went, oh, oh no. And I brought him over and I said, here's your problem. Like they love these tight spaces. They're gonna lay egg masses in there. Um, photos near the bases of the supports, the trunks, you know, this one here. This is also kind of leaning towards the camera. This is coated in egg masses. Um, it's a lot of crawling on the ground to, to find these. And then depending on the height of the grass, if there's weeds, if there's coverage, um, they would also lay them down at the bases of these wooden supports. So, you know, I pushed this grass away, but they were not immediately visible at first. And then there's these like concrete posts. These are actually leaning at 45 degrees um, and they lay their eggs on there too. Um, if, you, if you're gonna be looking for egg masses, definitely check some taller trees that are, especially those that are maybe uphill from the vineyard. Um, this is not always true. This is just something I've noticed from a few sites that um, this photo here, this is a tall oak tree. This is on the top of a hill sort of by itself, but it was right above the vineyard. Um, and, you know, my hypothesis is that adults climb up the hill, go up to this tree, lay their egg masses, and then the next year, nymphs hatch, crawl, march their way down to the vineyard to go feed on the grapes. Um, but it's not always the case. If there's trees here, say at the bottom of the hill and also on the edge of the vineyard, you're going to probably find them there too. Um, this sort of supports other research um, on lanternflies. So, the Leech Sisters did something like this, looking at um, distance from the edge of the vineyard. And they found that like 44% or almost half of the egg masses uh, were found within the first 15 meters of the vineyard edge. So that's kind of what we've also seen. Um, edge, like the transects on the outer sides of the vineyard plots always had egg masses. Those deeper into the vineyard, not always. Um, this paper, actually just came out very recently um, from Ann Nielsen's lab. This was looking at egg masses in New Jersey and wooded habitats. Um, and the basic gist here is that in plots that had uh, wild uh, grapevines out in the woods, most of those places with wild grapes had egg masses. Forest transects that did not have grapes, significantly lower um, occurrence. Here's a photo, this is a, 
former coworker David, um, we're out collecting adults. And if you know we see these big trunks or these big grapevines out in the woods, there's a pretty good chance we'd find adults out there uh, to bring back to the lab for other studies. So go back. Um, so there, you know, there's a photo of that wild grapevine. Uh, definitely, you might see lanternflies out there if this is on the property. All right, and the last thing I want to share, um, there was a question about similar looking egg masses. Um, praying mantids, when I was looking for these egg masses in the vineyards, saw lots of these praying mantid, um, they're called uthikas, so that's the fun word, uh, uthikas or egg masses. Um, you know, I, I don't, I can't say that they're actually significantly controlling the populations, but I just thought it was fun that um, we're seeing more of these egg masses in the vineyards. Um, in places that had low infestations, I was not finding them. Places that had a lot of lantern flag masses also had more of these mantid eggs. Oh, oh, but I want, yeah. The point I want to make is that the appearance is pretty distinct. It, you know, it has this sort of like ridge along the middle for this species. I think this is the Chinese mantid species as a more rounder um, bulbous egg mass. So if you see these, you know, leave them alone, let them hatch, let them, let them fight, kill other insects. Um, but you can scrape these if you want your liner flag masses or crush them. Um, and there they are, you know, this is just photos people have shared on social media, other websites showing these praying mantids attacking. Um, thank you for doing your job praying mantid, but again, I, I just don't know if this is going to solve our problem in the long term. Okay, uh, let me, before we get to the poll, just acknowledge all these groups, Cornell, other scientists, Penn State, USDA, um, everybody who helped on the Vineyard Project. Um, there's my email address, eclifton at Bioworks Inc. if you wanna talk more. Uh, but let's get to the poll question then. And I'll read it out loud. Among this list of objects and surfaces, which one is the least likely to have egg masses laid on it. There's a possibility they're on all of them, but I'm just asking which one is the least likely to have them? A, the undersides of tree branches. B, a rusty pole in a vineyard. C, the undersides of maple leaves. Or D, cherry tree bark. So which one would you check last? There it is. I'll give people about 10 more seconds to answer this poll. And the poll is closed. How do we do? Okay, so 74% said the undersides of maple leaves, followed by 14% on the cherry bark, 10% on the rusty pole, and 2% on the undersides of tree branches. All right, pretty good. The right answer was the uh, maple leaves. I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm sweating because I think Brian's probably got proof of it on, an, <laughs> on, a, on a leaf, but um, I have also seen egg masses on like skinny twigs and branches before too, so who knows. All right, questions, right? I can't see them yet, but I, I'm guessing you're going to read them to me. Oh, yes, yes. So I don't know if there's any slides that you want to put up while you're answering oh. questions, but we do have some that are already waiting for you and right. um, sure more will come in. So thank you so much, Eric. Excellent presentation. I'm so impressed with all the photos. This is very helpful. Um, let's see here. So I also see that Brian is still in the wings with us. And uh, Eric, before I get into some questions that are specific to your talk i invite both of you if you could comment on this first one that came in during your presentation um, from pat and jack is there a time to spray 
blueberry bushes for spotted lanternfly and um, is dinotefuran an active ingredient that can be used on that crop? Um, do either of you have comments about how much should we worry about this insect with blueberry? I mean, I'll just say like I've heard about it attacking blueberries, um, particularly nymph, like the, the nymph stages, but I, I don't know the latest on that. Is Brian on? He is, and let me try to unmute him. I think he's having oh. trouble getting unmuted. There you go. Yeah. So I have actually uh, high bush blueberries, uh, about 30 of them in our, in our uh, yard. And the most we've ever seen is the the early instars showing some interest in them. Um, not that that's any kind of definitive. If you're if you're growing in a larger operation, uh, monoculture blocks, you're you're probably going to have a different experience. Um, that said, uh, I just quick looked up with both venom and scorpion are the dinotefuron products that both list blueberry low bush and but not the high bush it says blueberry low bush but then at the end of the crop list it says cultivars varieties and or hybrids of these so i would probably say if you know for sure that you can use the one of those products um then then you're good to go and you're following the label if you're looking at this as a new thing i that wording on that label concerns me and i would i would go to the pennsylvania department of ag in our situation um for you for whoever your regulatory body is for insecticides if if you're looking at this as a first time try um i would i would put it through your regulatory body to, to interpret that wording um but in my experience they've not really bothered blueberries uh, beyond you know same as the rest of the plants early lush growth they'll feed on just about anything in those first second sometimes third and star uh stages thank you so much and i know that question came from massachusetts so for us it's the mass department of agricultural resources to ask those questions or clarification questions all right so let's get into some of the fungi questions from chris cordyceps are the zombie fungus type correct is this the only known <laughs> field infection uh, i was waiting for this question um so I, if you're talking about Ophiocordyceps, let me go to that. I think he's talking about this slide. Um, oh, all right, we'll do it the hard way. Um, I have only seen Ophiocordyceps one time in the wild. And here we are. So this is one sample we got from Pennsylvania, sort of down near Lancaster. Um, I tried to go to the site a couple of times, couldn't find more of them. This came in November. Um, gosh, what was the question again? It was like, is this the zombie fungus? What was the- Is this the question? zombie fungus? And yeah. is this the only known field infection? This is the only known field infection of this particular species. Um, this was found in November, 2020. Um, and Ann Hayek at Cornell has done, like, done more field work uh, this last summer and she's, you know, looking at possibly other new species infecting. So I don't know the latest on that, um, if she found more of it. But um, yeah, it, I don't know if it's the zombie fungus. There's other species of cordyceps that, you know, infect ants. Um, I was worried, not worried. I was wondering if people would ask about this question because there's a new show on HBO, you know, based on a video game. And um, if you're asking if it's gonna infect people, no, but. I shouldn't jump to those conclusions. I, think, I don't think you're asking that question because of zombies. <laughs> it's a good clarification but, to have. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I was touching I was touching this fungus, and as far as I know, I'm not a zombie, so uh, it's safe to me. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Speaking on behalf of all the zombies, no, sorry, I kid. Um, <laughs> this yeah. is great. Um, we have a bunch more questions. I just wanted to throw in a reminder, anyone looking for pesticide association credits, stay with us through the questions uh, here because we'll have more information following. Um, Phil asks or has a clarification question about the label for Bottega 
says yep. that the applicator must wear a respirator when spraying, but the applicator was not um, maybe in some of your photos or that you mentioned. Uh -huh. Can you comment? Yes, I can comment. I took those photos of John Ross spraying water for that same reason. So I was able to get close and get nice pretty photos of the sun and everything. Um, th that was just John spraying water. But yes, when you're spraying uh, Bottega or any other biopesticide, um, always read the label for proper PPE, um, which should include a respirator. But good eye, I'm glad you caught that, but <laughs> no one's ever asked that before. Thank you, thanks for the clarif clarification. Um, let's see here, Serena asks, does Bavaria have the potential to act like Entomophaga mimiga did for spongy moths? Um, not really. They're in my back in the intro. I talked a little bit about Bavaria and native insects. So let me see it. Pull this up. Um, functionally, no, it, it can't do what Entomophaga did to spongy moth um, or what Batcoa did to lanternflies. Bavaria is passed through contact, so whether an insect walks or comes into contact with a dead insect, um, it can get spread by like rain splash when it hits the spores and you know gets them airborne, um, sticky surfaces touching each other. So it all relies on horizontal transmission um, with Bavaria, whereas Batcoa and Tomophaga, those actually physically eject, like shoot the spores off, and then for some of those species like Entomophaga mimiga, the has the primary kinidae that is shot off, and then when it lands on a surface, it can jump a second time um, and sort of leapfrog to another surface. So um, we're going to get into taxonomy here, but um, Bacoa and Entomophaga belong to the Entomothrales group of fungi. So those are the more specialized um, fungi. They can affect behavior of the insects. Uh, there's a thing called summiting behavior where it sort of hijacks their um, their locomotive functions and behavior in some ways. So yeah, those are very, very fascinating, interesting fungi, um, but Bavaria does not shoot off or get spread through the air the same way. I think that addresses the question though. Yes, fascinating too, thank you. Um, John asks, uh, okay, do the spores released from spotted lanternfly after a Bavaria infection persist in the area to continue infecting SLF the following season? Yeah, so, um, yeah, Bavaria's life cycle is that, you know, it, it grows out of the insect, it has spores, it gets into the leaf litter, it gets into the dirt. Um, some Bavaria can actually um, inhabit plant material, and that term is endophytism. Um, you know, people have looked into how that like spikes plant defenses, if it improves plant growth, like a stimulator. Uh, a lot of neat stuff there, depends on the system you're looking at. But for the sake here, um, yeah, Bavaria persists in the soil for months to years. And then the next year, it starts to infect more insects. The inoculum levels change over time. And then when it gets to a point of high levels of Bavaria spores um, in the soil or on the surface, then the chances of infecting a lanternfly increase over time, especially when the adults are just like closer to the, the ground. Um, gosh, this really sparked, I, like I could go on and on about this, but um, I have some theories about, or hypotheses about how lanternflies, when they're adults, they will like go down to the bases of trees and like feed on exposed roots and, you know, they jump and land on the ground. So, you know, I think they pick up more Bavaria spores later on in the year. They also become sort of weaker and more stressed and become more susceptible. But I'm glad you asked. I'm going to, gosh, there's got to be an easier way. Hold on. Supplemental slides. So um, this is showing, there's this field site I went to multiple times. I would take soil samples and then I would plate them and count CFU, these are colony forming units on plates. Um, and basically what you're seeing is, this is like the concentration of Bavaria in the environment, okay? Let's just say it like that. And so um, March, they're at this level, like 8,000 CFUs. They go up in May, but all of a sudden it's hot in 2019. Numbers go down, I'm not surprised. Um, jump ahead to 2020, numbers are high, 
they're low again in the summer when it's hot. But here, um, whoop, in late 2020, uh, towards September, October, we started to see more and more lanternflies dying of Bavaria and Baco and other fungi. And sure enough, the level of Bavaria in the soil had also increased as um, the year progressed. So then it like, you know, dropped from here and then it almost doubled um, by November. So this was sort of demonstrating how Bavaria is fluctuating in the environment and how that corresponds to um, these infections. Great question. It kind of set me up to show a supplementary slide. Excellent. Thank you. Um, another question here from Serena. Do any of the biopesticides that you discussed appear to have any effect on the taste or she asks viability of grapes and other ag uh, products? Um, the oil formulations here, these are some of the products. Let me close this, get a better view. Um, I don't know how they affect the taste of grapes. I, I don't know how to answer that. Um, I would certainly hope that they look into that. Um, I know people have looked into how lanternfly feeding affects grape taste or phenology. Um, but I just want to comment that um, some of these products like oil-based formulations, like Botanigar DS, um, if you like over apply it or use too high, high of a rate, it could cause some phytotoxicity and maybe damage leaves. Um, but you know, it, it really depends on the rates and the plants you're spraying. Um, wettable powders tend to be pretty safe to use on plants with uh, less damage and probably less direct effects on flavor. Can, can you read the question just one more time, though? Yes, um, yeah. I think you've answered it well, but let me go back. Yeah. Um, do they appear to have any effect on the taste or the viability of grapes and other ag products? Um, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I don't know about the taste, but... Um, I definitely know that grape growers definitely want to be checking for like sulfur and other residues on their plants. There's a certain time window at which you have to stop using certain pesticides for that very reason so that they don't get into the grapes when they're harvested. Um, that's where I would say look at the product label and look at what it says for grapes um, there about the like pre-harvest interval. Thank yeah, that's you. all I can say. Yeah. Thank you. No, um, let's see another question here. Oh, from Chris. Are spotted lanternflies attracted mainly or only to grapes, uh, vitis species, or do they also prefer other species in the grape family? Um, he has examples here, uh, Virginia creeper. Um, I know they attack Virginia creeper. Um, actually, some labs in South Korea, when they were studying lanternflies, were rearing them on Virginia creeper. Um, I find that they really like oriental bittersweet. Um, when they're first and second in stars, I would catch them on multiflora rose. Um, and I would definitely find them on wild grapes. We've actually like uh, potted and rooted our own like wild grapes in the lab before, and they worked really good um, to rear the nibs. We even tried like apple seedlings and they did not do it. Like here they are on the apples, but they weren't feeding on these apples in the lab. Um, Cause this photo on the left, like this scared a lot of apple growers when this first came out, but I think they were just visiting those apples and moving on to the next place. And I'm sure Brian would agree, like apple farmers are not getting hammered by this pest right now. Um, and okay. So the question was about like different types of grapes. Yes. It, they like cultivated grapes. They like, Wild grapes, if you're asking if they prefer like whites or reds, I don't think there's any data that they prefer, you know, Chardonnay over Riesling or anything. Um, I know that Flor Avocado, if I believe I said her name right, Dr. Avocado at Penn State is looking at different grape cultivars and should have that data soon or publish the data soon. Um, she was even looking at muscadine grapes, like the sweeter grape varieties that are typically grown um, down south in like North Carolina and Florida. But I don't know yet about what happened with those muscadine grapes. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think the question was just even also about others in the grape family. Um, so not specific oh, okay. to varieties, but that's helpful as well. <laughs> yeah. um, oh, I do want to pass this along. 
from Roberto and, and maybe I can, if it's okay with you, put you both in touch. Um, he has, Roberto has reared spotted lanternfly in the lab and has isolated Bavaria species from field caught adults and yeah. has retested them on lab grown nymphs to satisfy Koch's postulate. Um, uh, needs help getting this genotyped. Can you <laughs> comment? Yeah, uh, Roberto, yeah, just send me an email, eclifton at bioworksinc.com. Um, uh, I can send you papers or information, but um, I hope you have a lab with a thermocycler and a freezer and all that other stuff. But yeah, you need to um, you need to sequence a couple of genes uh, to confirm what genotype it is. I should also say, like, since you bring that up, that, um, you know, when we did that study at Norristown in 2019, we'd spray and we, we would find GHA, that's the commercial strain, we'd find it in the liner flies. Um, but every other field, like every other place I've been to, I've never found GHA or any other commercial strain, um, like, naturally infecting lantern flies because people ask sometimes oh if you start spraying this stuff are you going to replace the native fungi by using these biopesticides and the answer is really no like gha you spray in the field it goes away after a couple of days or a weeks and then the native bavaria they stay there they hang out they're not going anywhere thank you so much um hopefully that's very helpful for another researcher uh jay is commenting here, I think, on the zombie fungus conversation, uh, just saying yeah. that what they mean by zombie fungus is that there's a fungus that infects ants that takes control of the ant and causes it to climb a tall grass, then clamp on. And once at height, the fungus bursts out of the ant and showers down <laughs> onto the others yeah. Yeah. and spreads from height of the grass, but the fungus actually takes control of the ant. I don't know if there's anything more you want to add to that. No, we, like, so I, I, I would be careful what I say, because I don't want to, like, insinuate that, like, bat coa or any other fungus does anything to lantern flies. I don't have evidence that um, bat coa hijacks lantern fly behavior, but I have at least one video proof of um, a lantern fly adult that has rhizoids those little white whisker structures let me just refresh this so these guys here these little white strands i have seen lantern flies with a couple of rhizoids starting to emerge and they were still somewhat mobile like they were lurching and kind of walking a little bit but that was probably like on their like they're on their deathbed they were like within hours of dying um but you know I, does it like force them to climb to high structures? I, I don't know, but the ant fungus, that cordyceps is well studied. Go on YouTube, look up cordyceps ant, you'll find a bunch of fun videos there. Thank you. Uh, I think we have one last question from Cheryl and then we'll get into um, the pesticide and association instructions for the end of the day. Although Brian is asking, if, he says he has 2020 Bavaria application results pulled up um, yeah. if there's interest. So I'll ask you about that after Eric, but the question from Cheryl is um, about honeybees feeding mm -hmm. on lanternfly honeydew um, and the taste of the honey produced is affected. But her question I think is, could fungal spores be carried back to the hive and then impact the honeybee hive? Great question, it gets asked a lot. Um... Actually, in order to commercialize these biopesticides a long time ago, uh, these invert pathologists looked at that very question. They, str they actually struggled to infect honeybees with Bavaria in the first place. Um, they had to use absurdly high rates just to get a few cadavers. Um, you know, I like to remind people of the microclimate in a beehive. It's very hot, dry, um, you know that that sort of can cook the Bavaria and kill it, but even if the lantern, if like a honeybee was killed in the process, they they collect their dead, they kick them out of the hive. So actually, the people working on this, who I talked to, they would set up little cups near the outside of the beehives, so that the bees would push the dead ones out, and they could collect cadavers, and then find those that were infected with Bavaria. But it was very rare. Um, my other comment there is like. 
there's no there's no other data to bite hold on bind my tongue be careful um you can certainly kill honeybees with bavaria especially if you over apply um and hit them with a high dose or if the inert ingredients like the oils you know just suffocate them sure you can definitely kill bees and other pollinators with these products um but based on the application rates on the label and the behavior i just described with the honeybees i don't see um, any cause for concern there's a lot of other things i'd be worried about with honeybees and you know varroa mites and nosema thank you so much yeah. that's that's very helpful sorry i was delayed in um, answering other questions <laughs> in the chat okay great um i think my only remaining question was was eric and brian did you want to take just like one minute to share any other results or um uh, what do you think uh brian do you want to chime in uh it's up to eric i have the uh the blue marsh stuff pulled up if you want to see but it basically just shows the same thing um i you, you mentioned about the helicopter um yeah, i remember there was backpacks and helicopters so i was sure. backpacks first and it was the helicopters were less effective and the reason we kind of think that is because it was spraying down onto the foliage and the lantern flies are underneath so yeah. Um, you know, it's but what was interesting here is that um this this is showing the ground applications which did the best and the first ones in June uh, we tested two different products. One is Apprehend, which is not labeled for outdoor use, but it's an oil based, uh, and the other was Batega. And we did forty two percent and twenty four percent from uh, mycosis infection in the first app. Uh, the second app between the two, they ran neck and neck, 15 and 17. And then uh, by the time we got into the third application, we only had 11% infection rate. And uh, for whatever the reasons are, uh, this this is at the same time as the um, first application in Norristown Farm Park that Eric showed that did so well. So it's the variability and the frustration of, of using this in the field versus in the lab. Uh, yeah. When we did this in 2021, we took a look at just application methodology and um, we did it later in the fall, September, when we see that naturally occurring Bavaria infection going on in the ground and, you know, finding the individuals on the ground, the, the, the what we thought was perfect conditions and our, our best infection rate was 4%. So we, we don't know why, why the variation in the field is the best I can say but that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Is there anything you want to add to that? Or um, this has been excellent and very thorough. Thank you both. <laughs> no, nothing to add. Just that, yeah, what Brian said is true, that it varies place to place. You know, I, it sounds like there was some success this year in Virginia Tech, but I wasn't involved in the study, so I can't even really confirm you know, the methods that uh, they were using in Virginia. But um, yeah, even there's even a student at Virginia Tech who's looking at spraying egg masses and it's not to kill the eggs, but it's actually to like infect the nymphs as they emerge. Um, you know, Brian and I have some of our own personal thoughts about it. And I, I could see it working on the nymphs as they emerge. I just don't know about relying on that to control a population. So that's why, you know, Brian and I sort of talk in circles about like, where and when to use these biopesticides. Like if you're a homeowner and you just don't want to use a chemical, um, sure, you could probably use it to manage your backyard, but also understanding that the, adult, the adults, they just move around so much, they're going to come in and it's going to look like it didn't even work. So my yeah. argument back to that is you could use insecticidal soap and as long as you make contact, you're going to get a good kill. So, you, go. you know, <laughs> is it worth it? Yeah. Thank you both so much. We have comments coming in to thank you again for another great presentation, fantastic pre presentations for the day, all sorts of comments coming in. So um, I just want to thank both of our presenters. And at this point, we're going to switch to the pesticide and association credit process. But I'm going to give Ellen a moment to stop our recording before we do so. Okay, all set. All set. Okay, great. So um, 
Folks uh, in the audience, thank you for attending today. Anyone who does not need pesticide or association credits, you are free to hop off. However, there is a survey when you leave that we do hope everybody attending today will fill out. And I'm going to give those instructions for all in just a moment. But I understand that if folks don't need pesticide or association credits and need to run, they can. Let me just get my PowerPoint up so I can remember the reminders that I need to tell folks. Um, okay, here we go with that. I'm also going to check. Oh, um, another announcement or two that I want to make before I forget and before I go through these slides is that, um, again, if the survey that we talk about regarding pesticide credits uh, that is at the end of today's broadcast. If that does not pop up for you after we close the webinar, every single participant here will get a link in an email from GoToWebinar to fill that survey out um, approximately an hour after the webinar ends. So if for some reason you can't fill out this survey immediately uh, after we end for this morning, uh, again, you'll get that link in an email. Also, uh, another reminder about links, information that was shared in a link form from day one is uh, available on our website. And I know Ellen has put in the chat the website that uh, also has recordings of our past invasive insect webinars. Um, that will have useful information from yesterday and today on that website. So we, we hope that folks will check that if they have any questions. Okay, so. Folks that need association credits, uh, we have up here on the screen the instructions for our MCAs and MCLPs. If you can please uh, go to uh, either of these corresponding websites, uh, if you uh, are a member of either of these associations or both, please fill out your webinar confirmation forms for today. My understanding is that you need to do that each day that you attend these uh, presentations. So if you did it, uh, on day one, do it again for day two. And just trying to get my slide to progress here. Um, for these associations, uh, for ISA folks, SAF, CFE, and MCH, the process is a little bit different. You're going to go to this Google Form link that is shown on the screen. It is also in the chat, so you can copy and paste I suggest that you copy and paste everything that's come through to you in the chat. Uh, make sure that you fill out this Google form again for ISA, SAF, CFE, and MCH folks by this coming Monday the 13th. So make sure that you do this again specific for today. This is a new form different from day one. Um, and you're going to include this new session number. So even a screenshot or a photograph of this screen might be helpful for you. Uh, you need to write down this new session number, NE-23-022. So make sure that you're doing this if you're looking for the credits, again, for our ISA, SAF, CFE, and MCH individuals. And then uh, last but not least, <laughs> for all the questions we've gotten about pesticide credits and that process, um, at the very end of today, once we uh, close the broadcast, you will get a survey prompt. Uh, we hope everybody will answer this survey because there are questions on there that help UMass Extension to better serve you, whether or not you're a pesticide applicator. However, specific to the pesticide applicator folks, you need to fill out the survey and the information that's requested so that we can issue your pesticide credits. Those again will only be issued to registrants who request credit on that survey and also completed the poll questions during today's live presentations. We cannot issue you credit if we did not receive your poll question responses. A certificate of attendance with your name and license number will be sent to your email for today's program. So two pesticide credits are available for the, the categories that are listed here, as well as the applicator's license uh, for Massachusetts, but also all uh, applicable New England states, I, I think, are able to get these credits as well. Um, 
a little bit of a change and an announcement from day one for folks that are here for both days or all three days in this series. Um, the forms, your pesticide forms, instead of doing it each uh, week that we hold one of these webinars, we're going to send them out in a big batch to make Ellen's life a little easier. So uh, look for your pesticide forms from Ellen in your email by the end of February. And again, you will get these forms for each of the three dates or any of the dates that you attend from Ellen at the end of February. So please check your inbox and your spam or junk folders for a message from Ellen by the end of February if, if you have not received them. And then again, uh, anybody who wants to watch these presentations uh, as an archived recording or share the, the recording with friends, you can do so at the website that's been um, shared in the chat. And we do encourage you to, to share this information with anyone that you think it'd be beneficial for. All right, I think those are my pesticide and association credit announcements. I just wanna put in one more plug uh, for folks to attend day three of our programming um, on Wednesday, February 22nd. We'll be back for the final day of our invasive insect presentations. And we have uh, Dr. Robert Mara from the Connecticut Ag Experiment Station. We're stretching things a bit. He's gonna be talking about beech leaf disease. If you're familiar with that, it's actually a nematode that causes it, not an insect, but a lot of activity with beech leaf disease in, in recent years in Massachusetts and New England. So we had to ask him to speak. I couldn't resist. And also Nicole Kelleher with our Mass Department of Conservation and Recreation Forest Health Program will be talking about invasive forest insects in Massachusetts. So we hope everybody will join us for our third and final day as well. Okay, Ellen, anything else you wanna get out to folks before we, we close for today? Uh, nope, just a clarification that uh, the form that requests ISA, uh, et cetera, credits is for MCH. Those are mass certified horticulturists. And if you want MCA, which is a mass certified arborist, you need to go to the Mass, Arbor mass Arborist Association website. Thank you, sorry if I bumbled that. <laughs> okay, all right, thanks so much, Ellen. Thanks everybody for attending and enjoy the rest of your day.